Well, this is, uh, this is an exciting week for us, and um, we've been waiting six months uh, for uh, this point in time. Um, we have spent unending hours this summer uh, planning for this moment, uh, for this week. Um, our leadership team, our technology staff, our, uh, our custodians, our maintenance staff, our school nurses, um, everyone. I mean, I could go on and on. But, uh, you know, I think of the old uh, Bill Belichick term of no days off. Uh, I don't think anyone, and I mean this very seriously, I don't think anyone took any days off this summer to, to plan for this, uh, this opening. Uh, it was uh, wonderful to welcome the teachers two weeks ago. Uh, they have been uh, preparing for this uh, Wednesday with two weeks of professional development, both in person and uh, remotely. Uh, they have done an outstanding job. Uh, they're enthusiastic about the return because we know that this is a profession about connecting not only the delivery of, of curriculum, but it's about connecting with children. And uh, as I said um, a couple of weeks ago, and I think I repeated this morning, is uh, students need our teachers who have made us the number one ranked school system in the state, but very importantly, uh, all of us need them also to get back to some semblance of normalcy, to get back to the profession as we, as we know it, so that 
So welcome everyone back. Uh, we'll be talking more tonight about what we've done uh, for planning uh, for a healthy, safe opening of our school system uh, this week and look forward to um, answering any questions that the public may have. Fantastic. Um, Carrie, uh, Assistant Superintendent update. Sure. Uh, several weeks ago I had shared um, Uh, I had shared that Westford this year qualified for Title I funds, which is a federal grant. Uh, the total is $82,000, and we qualify based on our percentage of low income. So for the past several years, we have not qualified, but for FY21, we had. So um, we did a bit of a needs assessment and discussed some of the areas of need, and we know that social-emotional learning is certainly an area that keeps coming up year after year. Uh, we do have to prioritize a school or schools based on their um, low income percentage. So the Miller School um, has the greatest need. They are they have 14% of low income students. And as a result, we are um, allocating funds to the Miller School to hire an additional Title I adjustment counselor for that school. Um, we are posting within the next week or so, and there are certainly very um, specific guidelines that you have to follow for any use of Title I staff or materials, in this case staff. And we will continue to communicate with families throughout the year to share information around Title I, and we look forward to having this extra resource. In regards to homeschooling, we obviously had an influx of students who chose homeschooling. <coughs> so shifting gears a little bit, we knew that we would have quite a spike based on uh, COVID-19 and people's comfort either returning to school or even the remote learning academy model that we offer. So last year in 2019-20, we had 36 total homeschool students. And this year we had an additional uh, 40 join us on top of those 36. So we did expect something along those lines. We had parents submit very thoughtful homeschool plans and I reviewed everyone individually and those have been approved. Some additional plans may, become, may come trickling in and I'll share with you if those numbers change at all significantly. As Bill mentioned, our professional development over the past two weeks has been uh, quite a blessing and really having the ability to work with staff, give them some time just to get situated, to collaborate, but also some very direct training in areas that will help particularly around um, the technology aspect of our hybrid model. And I wanna thank Julie Bedreau and Stephanie Goslin for doing a tremendous amount of work because it was so technology focused. Uh, they worked days and nights to get many, many sessions, lots of choices for teachers so that they could select uh, sessions that met their individual needs. We had 25 in-house trainers and offered a choice of workshops and staff could rotate through the workshops based on their level of interest. We also had keynotes. Uh, we had our own Jenny Kravitz present on equity and access in remote learning. And then we had two challenge success keynotes over the course of the two weeks. One was on pedagogy and engagement in remote learning, and the other was on nurturing student connections in remote learning, because we know we have to connect with students, and we'll continue to do that. That's not anything new, but doing it in a remote setting is. The feedback that we received is tremendous. We, um, today we shared a survey, and we had probably close to 100% participation because it's also the attendance and we asked for feedback and it's really incredibly positive. So I just commend to everybody who was involved in making those two weeks successful. Additionally, tomorrow we um, have a kind of a soft start with our orientations at the middle school and the high school levels. Orientation is virtual at the middle school for grades six through eight, and for WA, it's grade nine. At the middle school, we were able to um, include other grade levels as well because of the fact that it is virtual. So it's not that the sixth graders have to share a platform or a meeting with the entire school. 
it's that they will be able to travel through to see their individual sixth grade teachers and because it's remote seventh and eighth grade can do the same and then kindergarten and third grade worked very hard to make a plan to include some in-person time with these students because of their age level and so we've got uh, third graders coming pod A in the morning pod B in the afternoon so that they get some face-to-face -face time with teachers there's also a virtual component for our remote learning Academy students and kindergarten over the um, two or three days has appointments where students in small groups with one adult is able to come in and have a tour through the building and meet face to face. So we're excited about the creative ways that principals work together to offer a quality welcome given the restrictions. I also have just a couple of updates regarding the return and the hybrid model. Uh, the superintendent and Bill, forgive me if you were going to mention this, but did receive the approval for our time on learning waiver. Mm -hmm. We know that particularly with the early release model, there are some additional hours that we have to um, allocate for students traveling home in the middle of the day. And there are several districts who did that similar model and applied for the waiver and um, it was a very thorough process where they had called us and interviewed us and explained hour for hour where our numbers had come from and after that um, meeting they quickly followed up with an approval and commended us for doing a great job we also have some tweaks to the calendar nothing substantive that would need to come up yet um, to the committee but we just want to share that on our calendar on the website we have marked a slash through every Wednesday to remind people that Wednesdays are early release days meaning that after students who are in get released to go home and their um, at home peers do their asynchronous work there is no additional afternoon um, logging on our assignments and that is because this is such an incredibly new model it's really important that we have staff together additional ongoing training is that at all schools that is at all all schools okay. yes. um, so additionally on the calendars we marked which weeks are associated with which in school pods so for example this week we have our a pod as the pod who will be showing up to school while B pod will be asynchronous at home until the afternoon where they lo um, log on with their teacher and just for planning purposes parents are able to look at the calendar and look out to a particular week in a particular month and be able to see if that's an A pod week or a B pod week and as I mentioned just so everyone's clear this week even though it's short this is an A pod week um, for those students to come in we are reminding all families that we encourage the students who are at home to follow the schedule for the the classes who are in school and we've got the schedule outlined and while it is asynchronous and certainly has some ability for students and families to be flexible we encourage um, students to keep as close to the schedule as possible at times at Westford Academy in particular because they're doing the live streaming model for the remote learning Academy students there will be opportunities for students who are asynchronous at home to log on live with the RLA students the remote learning Academy students and even though it's technically their asynchronous at home week they're still they will be maybe still called in to then access that class remotely so they can fully participate in the live lesson during that time. We talked about the fact that we would like to try to stay as consistent as possible within departments. The math department at Westford Academy or most members of the math department felt as though that would be a model that they would like to rely on and certainly will give any students ample notice so that they can plan around making sure that they're logged on during that math period uh, whereas the English department for example liked thinking about the asynchronous time as an opportunity to do certain readings which can be done obviously independently asynchronously and then 
follow up for the afternoon log on for some extension and um, live teaching during that time. So while there will be a mixture of that, again, we want to make sure that students are um, never feeling confused. Do I log on? Do I not? Naturally, the at-home asynchronous time, the answer is they are not logged on, but they will be informed with advance notice if they do have to log on during a certain period. Um, and then at kindergarten through fifth grade, <laughs> We also understand for that asynchronous at-home week, it will take some grown-up support. And as a result, we have um, agreed with the teachers that they would be posting by Sunday at 5 p.m. any work that needs to be accomplished over the course of the week for those students at home. So families can log on on Sunday evening if they want to allocate their time in a certain way so that they can prepare themselves for being available because we know it'll be more of a partnership between students and um, families at that level. And then lastly, I just kind of want to summarize and, and close with um, sharing that the past several months have certainly been the most challenging work we have all experienced in our careers. Uh, we've done our best to welcome students back this week and despite the constant obstacles and barriers um, that wait around the corner, we're very excited for what we have created given the many restrictions. I'm grateful to have a superintendent who provides a level of stability and experience, which has helped us all work together um, in getting accomplished everything that we have during these very unsettling times. It's helped our team really stay focused and stay on point. I ask that families and the school committee also please know that principals and teachers and all staff have been working diligently to make the return to school a positive and engaging experience for all students. We have asked a lot from families and they have delivered and it hasn't been easy and it's been frustrating but they have delivered and we're grateful. Students and parents have waited a long time to get back into the swing of school, and we are elated that the week has finally arrived where we can welcome our students back, whether it be remote, in person, or both. Um, but we do ask for families, continued patience and support, because, there, because there's no doubt that additional kinks will come up as this whole <coughs> thing plays out because it's so uncharted. So please give teachers and principals grace. Um, we are all going to be learning together through this time. So I wish our staff, students, and families the best of luck as they prepare for this unusual opening. Thank you. We all may be wearing masks, but I can see all the smiles that are going <laughs> around the table right now. Um, the, this has been an extraordinary amount of work and um, it, it's really exciting to, to have the beginning of school finally be here. Um, I know that having the, the additional 10 days um, must have been difficult for students to wait and, and for parents and families to wait, but it has been so incredibly valuable for our staff to have this time to plan and prepare um, for this very unconventional school year. And I'm, I'm really, really grateful that the, the state um, made that allowance and, and granted all of our, our teachers um, that time um, to really prepare appropriately. Um, I know we'll talk more about building updates when we get there, but um, it is exciting <coughs> to be in the building this week and mm -hmm. to, to see um, all the preparations that are being made. Um, there was a lot of information in there. Um, questions from the committee just on, on some of the things Carrie shared, or are we ready to, to move forward? I had one, and the question I had was, there was so much information packed in there. If, if I'm a parent and I'm at home and I'm still trying to figure out how does this schedule work? When does my kid need to be online? A pod, B pod, where, where, where do I get my schedule? What's the best place for them to go to get that information? Well, it would be on our, we've got that information on our um, COVID-19, 
re reopening of schools section of the website. Yeah. Okay. And also individual school websites have been providing information as well. Okay. Indiv the, the Westford K-12 website, COVID-19 section, or individual school websites. That's right. Okay. And I know students also have like their Google Classroom accounts <coughs> where their teachers will mm -hmm. be communicating with them through that mechanism. Um, the other thing I have noticed um, frequently in school committee emails is um, oftentimes um, school committee or, or central administration may be getting very specific questions, questions that are specific to a particular school or, or questions that are really specific to a particular student. Um, while we are always interested to hear the feedback, we may not be the best source of information. Um, the best source of information that may get you the quickest answer you need is someone that is building based. So if you have a question, if you have a concern, if, if there's an issue, you're concerned about what pod your child may have been placed in, um, the, your best resource is going to be your building principal or um, a building guidance counselor or the, your classroom teacher. They're probably gonna be able to help you um, the quickest. So I think Absolutely. that's good, yeah. good to know where to go to when we all need help in these new, new times. Um, Ingrid, um, finance update now, or are we going to kind of do it yeah, throughout the agenda? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Is your computer? Gotcha. Um, uh, school committee update. Alicia. So the search subcommittee met for the first time uh, about two weeks ago. Um, the current search committee is myself and Chris Sanders and Sean Kelly. And we had a pretty brief meeting just going over the broad strokes of what a search would look like, um, sort of what the process is. And we expressed um, our desire to have it be a very open and a very inclusive process. Um, we were going to meet again this week, but with everything else going on, we thought we should push it out another week. We're all very busy right now. So um, we will be meeting again next week. And remember, if you want to um, be alerted to those agendas and meeting times, you can go to the town webpage, just Google Town of Westford Agenda Center, and you can sign up specifically for sub that subcommittee alert, so you will get an email when an agenda is posted, and we hope to meet again next week. Other um, school committee updates? policy subcommittee also met a couple of weeks ago and um, started to talk about policies that might be on the radar. I uh, just, and we'll talk a little bit more about this because I think there's a sense from the subcommittee that, um, you know, some of the conversations around racial justice and diversity and inclusion might feed into possibly looking at some of the policies. We think that's very likely. Um, whatever the DEI committee that forms both at the town side and is active at the school side will likely inform uh, possible policy changes. But we also are proactively looking at things that we can look at now. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in the, on the agenda item later. Um, this, I think it would be an appropriate time to mention that we did just, this is sort of an FYI for, for people who might be avid policy watchers. Um, there were a number of policies that we saw referenced, but we couldn't find them. And so um, they do exist. They are now on the website. They've been, um, they were off the website for a while. They were listed, but not linked to on the website. Um, and their policies P7401 through P7409. Uh, there's nine policies. They really deal with school committee meetings, um, what, you know, what a meeting is, notifications about meetings, agendas, um, minutes of meetings, quor quorum, voting procedures. So they're really the business of, of the meetings. There's, you know, uh, there wasn't anything too surprising in there, but uh, just in, in a, like I said, FYI for folks that those policies are, are live on the Westford Schools policy page um, and have always been in existence and adhered to, but now are viewable by everybody. So thanks to everybody who helped corral those. So for policy wonks, this is like buried treasure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, the the third subcommittee um, that school committee has is the new school finance subcommittee. 
Um, we have not met as yet, but we will be meeting in the near future, and that agenda will get posted online in the same way, um, as Alicia mentioned, that the other subcommittee agendas do get posted. Um, the, the other thing that I will include in the in school committee update is, isn't really a school committee update, but it's based on some, some feedback that we have been receiving from parents. Um, as everyone has said, everyone in the school system has worked extraordinarily hard to make it possible to open schools in a hybrid model. Um, if anybody's been watching the news, you may have noticed that a number of school districts in our area have um, been forced into a remote context due to large parties and gatherings. Um, when large parties and gatherings occur, we know there is a tendency for young people to want to gather. Of course, it is a natural, developmentally appropriate thing to do, but it is just fraught with peril during these times. So we are really asking for the community's help and for parents' help with this. Um, if we want to stay together in school, we need to be safe together in the community. And um, we are looking for the community's help because we don't want to have to be forced down that path um, because of large social gatherings where social distancing isn't practiced and masks aren't being worn. So um, if the community can please help us with that, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. We're really just trying to keep everyone, our students, our staff, and their families as safe as possible during these times. Um, can I give an update? Absolutely, absolutely. More updates. Um, so you mentioned the finance um, subcommittee, which we're hoping will meet. The capital planning uh, will be meeting for the first time this week um, and then monthly, and I will be joining that. Um, I did have a question for Ingrid and Bill, just a, a quick question about the um, job description and salary. Um, we still haven't seen that hit. I know we've been doing some other things, so, um, but I just don't want it to, to oh, fall okay. off. No, that, that, that will be coming back. We're very much okay. aware of that. Okay. Um, and I don't know, I may be out of step. Next meeting, just for an FYI, it looks like we're meeting on a Tuesday, not a Monday. So um, because of Yom Kippur, it looks like we've moved our meeting off one day. Um, so don't look for us here two Mondays from now. Um, and last is totally not a school committee thing, but I think um, I would like to congratulate and give acknowledge Marianne Serafin as mm -hmm. she um, finally, as she, I, I think sadly, um, but also joyously, um, put it, you know, closed the Westford Parent Connection, um, which was an invaluable tool to all of us in the school systems in those workshops that she put together so diligently month after month after month. So I want to thank her and that whole group um, for all that they did for the school system. One of the great contributors in town. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Just an invaluable resource. Uh, yeah. uh, it's sad, sad to see it go, and, and hopefully something new will, will spring up to take its place. Um, Valerie. Yeah, sorry. I just realized that um, at the last meeting I had talked about that COVID relief fund, but in the period since um, it has I've um, been able to publicize it, so I just wanted to make that official announcement here. Um, so again, the local town council of aging um, social worker does, even though she's based at the Cameron Senior Center, does apply to every resident in Westford, despite age. Um, and they have an existing COVID-19 relief assistance fund, assistance fund, um, and we. We believe that this can be a resource to families who are experiencing a financial hardship with the increased expense of child care this year. Um, so all the information I believe has been um, on our Blackboard um, communication. I think it's been updated on the town website. It's definitely on the town council of aging website. Um, I put it on my Facebook page and a couple of different Facebook groups. But basically, if you have the means, a private donation would be great. And if you need the support, the information is out there on how to 
apply and um, talk to Alex and Christopher, Christopher, the social worker. Valerie, for people who want to make donations, what's the, the best way to do that? So the local Council of Aging website, so westfordma.gov slash COA, um, they take a credit card, but there is a fee, um, or you can mail a check to Cameron Senior Center and just write COVID-19 relief fund in the memo line. I think the PO box is like 2223 Westford, Mass. Thank you. Thank, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you to you um, and um, our town partners for, for, yeah. for, um, for working through that. I know that there are a lot of families who are struggling with the additional cost of child care, and it's wonderful to know that, that there is some relief. And yes, certainly, if people are in need of that, please reach out to that resource. And if people have the means and are able to make a donation, that's greatly appreciated. I've also started talking with um, Nancy Cook, who has like a private um, Westford Remembers COVID-19 Relief Fund that tries to find people who either might not hit the qualification income guidelines um, who or who don't reach out for that assistance for one reason or another. Um, so I, I owe her a, a phone call and to kind of publicize that, but that's also in the works too. So we're trying. That's fantastic. C kudos, kudos to the Westford community and, and how deeply they care. Um, together, together we're going to make this work. Um, and um, our student representatives, um, can we, we elevate them to our screen and see <coughs> if they have an update for us or questions for us? I think Brian said nothing. There's Brian. We see you, Brian. We can hear you, Brian. Nope, no, now we can. Now we can. <laughs> now we can. Well, I just said I had nothing to say. But. Oh. <laughs> is, is, Hannah, is Hannah on the line? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I just had a few questions. I think I, I sent them to Mr. Sanders and um, Ms. Miller. Uh, can I just pull them up? I don't. Do, 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 you, want us, do you want us to just go through the, those, those questions, Hannah, or do you want to read them off? Um, well, if you guys, I don't, I think some of them were addressed already. Um, most of them were about like scheduling and then sports. Um, yep. And like, I think a lot of people were confused on whether we had like what classes we had each day with the afternoon and morning, if we had like the same classes in the morning and afternoon every day. And then um, there was a lot of concern about the parking passes too. So. Okay, well, let's take that one at a time. If high school students are confused about their schedule, what's the best thing for them to do? <laughs> yes, I'm, Mr. Antonelli, has, do you know if the schedule has been? Schedules have gone out. Uh, put out. The hybrid model has been sent out for part one, part A, and part B. So if you have individual questions they can reach out to the guidance counselor reach out to the dean of students reach out to me um you know it's just it's going to take some time to figure out that puzzle you know so but schedules were open today um so they can see the schedules in advance and um and then the teachers will certainly go through you know but we just got to get the students in and into the rituals and routines uh, and then we'll, we'll get some rhythm to this so the answer to you know is it the same classes in the afternoon as it is in the morning and the answer is yes so think of it as kind of like a 90 minute block of time for each class and the first hour is if you're in school live um, one hour ish blocks for all three classes and then the following afternoon after you go home have lunch then you're doing the asynchronous parts of those same three courses so yes to that question about is it the same in the afternoon as it is in the morning. I think that really helps. That's a really clear way of describing it. We had a question from um, a member of the public asking um, if we could just clarify in the Wednesday early release one more time. I know you, you touched on that. Um, and they had concern that the WA schedule that just came out doesn't show this. Correct. Um, 
so the WA schedule, it's not the typical early release time as it is with uh, what, what we typically do for an early release, whereas the others, it's whatever time we've always had for early release times. But it's actually a um, 112 dismissal, so it's just over a half hour time on Wednesdays where students are um, ending the day, it's a shortened day, but not a formal full early release day as we know them. But it is a shorter day on that day. So the schedule that we have, there's a grayed out section and the schedule has been revised and then relinked. There's a grayed out section to give uh, staff that time in the afternoon on Wednesdays. So Wednesdays, WA actually goes the longest day. That's right. In time. That's right. Whereas everybody else gets out at lunch. That's and doesn't right. have afternoon. There is still some afternoon activity. Well, remember, so so they WA is still dismissed at lunchtime. Sure, just sure. like everybody else. So the students go home sure. at their regular early release time, but the day doesn't stop there. They do log on after lunch, and there is the live time for the at home right. people. It's just a shorter time. But say at Abbott they go home at lunch and they don't have any responsibility after that correct okay yes in the afternoons at wa um, after the students are dismissed there are three blocks in the afternoon okay on wednesdays there are only two blocks in the okay. afternoon at wa and the schedule that mr antonelli sent out today is I think answers one of Hannah's questions is that's where we start with block A and we it shows the rotation over the first two weeks. Yes. Okay. Yes. Correct. And then pod B will be another the full week. Correct. And so I think that answered Hannah's question as to where do we start? Yeah, WA parents and students should definitely go to the website, get the regular schedule and the, the first two week schedule. Um, it's a little bit of a Jenga miracle the general. way it all fits together so <laughs> you know nicely done but mm -hmm. study it. it 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 will hopefully make sense so i know one of the questions on hannah's list was um uh some of them were scheduling related one of them was will science classes be having labs and i know from the tours that the answer to that is yes mm -hmm. <laughs> um the science teachers have come up with with interesting and creative ways to do labs they've set up special laboratory spaces often in, in cafeterias and um, science classes will have labs and and remote students will also um, be invited to participate in those labs there is there is creativity coming so stay tuned from your science teachers um, because indeed there will be labs um, i know um, another question hannah asked was um, parking passes and I know we got a number of um, messages from students about the increased cost of the parking pass. So going back in time, um, we initially made a decision on the increased parking fee because we did an evaluation of all local towns and found that really Westford was um, a dirt cheap bargain um, and that many surrounding towns were really charging much more for um, the costs of student parking. And I do want to clarify that those were budgetary decisions that were made last winter. Um, they were in part made to deal with a lot of the, the budget crunch that we were facing at that time. And, um, and it is important to understand that any time a fee is charged, whether the fee is charged for parking that money can only be used for parking related issues. We can't take parking money and use it to, you know, pay for science labs. That money has to be used for anything that is parking related. Things like parking lot maintenance, um, things like snow plowing, things like uh, the costs for employing a traffic guard, all things of that nature. So um, similarly with athletic fees, those fees can only be used for athletics. Bus fees can only be used for buses. You can't use bus fees to fund those science labs. It doesn't work that way. So please understand that whenever a fee is charged in our school system, it is really only covering a portion of what it actually 
costs our school system to deliver that service. The bus fees only cover a portion of what it actually costs the school system to supply busing for our students. Uh, the same is true for the parking fee. Uh, we did fully recognize that that was an increase this year and there are a lot of uncertainties to the school year. So this summer we did make the decision to at this time only charge half of the fee. So students are only being charged $100. Um, that goes for seniors and we've now opened the lot up to juniors. So juniors are able to park as well. Uh, we're hoping that that takes some pressure off the buses and gives another transportation opportunity for students and parents. So that, that gives you a little background on that. We will wait and see what the year brings and whether if there will be any fee, additional fee for the year and what that fee might be. But that'll just be adjusted depending on what our year looks like. Um, did I think a lot of your other questions, Hannah, were related to clubs and sports? So can we? Um, I should comment on the parking fee. I know oh, that. Sure. Oh, sure. <laughs> Sorry. To a voice from beyond again, is Brian. Go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, Brian. I just had a comment on it because I know that like the parking fee money can only be used for parking lot like duties, but I just do know like Chelmsford which they don't pay anything for their parking ticket, for their parking passes, as well as like, even if other towns do, I don't see Westford as a town that just follows other towns. And since this year we have seniors and juniors parking, which is double the, in, double the revenue for students paying for parking passes, it should be plenty enough money to cover, as well as we should be trying to make it easier, easier for students to actually afford a parking pass due to transportation issues with COVID to make it safer for everyone to take their own cars to school rather than discourage a student who worked, what, 20, over 20 hours just to pay for one, like, semester of a parking ticket pass. I think that's quite ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Fe feedback, feedback well taken. Um, and, and I think the, that we will take that into account depending on what the year looks like, and we'll see whether um, there would be any additional fee for the rest of the year or whether this fee would cover longer than just the first semester. I think we'll, we'll just have to stay tuned on that to see what our year looks like. Um, any, um, oh, there, I know a lot of the, a lot of uh, Hannah's other questions that um, she sent to us in advance, thank you for that, were sports related. Um, a couple are, are club related. Um, and uh, I don't know exactly how things like student government elections will play out. I'm sure that's something you'll be figuring out at the high school, but uh, one of the questions was, will we have clubs? And the answer is yes, there will be clubs. They may look different. We're, um, it may take time to get things up and running, but there will be clubs at the high school and uh, stay tuned for more information on that. Uh, and we'll be talking about sports in a bit. Um, reopening updates. Well, I could, I could talk for an hour on this one, but I won't. And um, uh, first of all, I, I just um, I want to thank the community for being so patient, as uh, everyone has said to this point in time. Um, I do want to refer parents once again, if they need specific information, to our reopening plan that's on the website. Uh, there are four components of it. There's teaching and learning operations, social emotional readjustment, and hygiene protocols and facilities cleaning. Um, there is much detail in all of those sections of the, um, of the reopening plan. And Gloria, I wanted to reiterate something you said because it's been in the, in the news so frequently and I've talked with a number of area superintendents that we're doing everything we can and we have done everything possible to create a safe environment for our students and our staff. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. Um, you know, the importance of mask wearing, distancing and hand sanitizing does not only apply to school. And I'm asking like you have in the past for, for parents, for our students to, to please be observant of those um, habits that uh, the CDC and uh, other uh, uh, infectious disease professionals have said are extremely important to reducing 
the uh, transmission of this virus, and that is the, the mask wearing, the distancing, and the sanitizing of your, of your hands. Uh, we know that, as you said, through parties, through social activities, people, I think, have a tendency to let down. Uh, there's not sometimes as much publicity from time to time given to COVID-19 uh, matter. And so we want to we want to keep children in school. We want to keep staff in school. It is so important that we we'll be able to gain traction and momentum in moving through the school year, uh, particularly starting back after a six-month hiatus from seeing our students and our staff personally. So, so please do practice those protective measures uh, in everything you, you do. Uh, now, just some, some basic reopening information. Um, once again, we're going to ask parents to check the children daily for any symptoms. And if they exhibit any symptoms that have been listed in our uh, reopening plan or in our website, and our nurses, our school nurses have been extraordinary in, in placing information on our website. Any symptoms, please keep your child home. Okay, it is m most important that you do that. Uh, the bus drivers will be self-checking to make sure that they do not have any symptoms because our, our instruction to the bus company is if they have any symptoms, they're not to drive. Okay, they have to find a, a substitute driver. Um, I would ask the parents to make sure that your child is wearing a mask at the bus stop and as they get on the bus it, it will have to be worn on the bus both to and from uh, from school and please uh, I would send a, an extra one now do know that we um, have supplied the bus company with masks in case a child for whatever reason doesn't have one or or the straps break um, we have supplied uh, you know the school and our, our schools with extra masks in case it a child has problems with the mask or one breaks or, uh, or becomes wet, in, in which case it, um, it reduces the filtration uh, capabilities. Um, so uh, do have the masks uh, ready. Um, for right now, we, uh, in a, in a uh, lengthy bus meeting this afternoon, we're going to keep the bus routes the same as last year. Okay, we think that's the safest thing to do uh, they have been relatively stable for several years. Please know that there may be some adjustment needed uh, in the bus routes uh, over the next two to three weeks. That is normal every year. We uh, always have some adjustment to routes based on overcapacity and one other vehicle may be under capacity and may help out. Um, that uh, there will be no assigned seats on the bus becomes, because that becomes very difficult to monitor. The buses have been marked with an X the student is, and, and you've seen that in the bus rides to the school tours, you know, don't sit on the X, but you sit on the space next to the X. One child to a seat. Uh, siblings are allowed to uh, sit together, uh, those from the same uh, family. Um, you know, if there's a relatively full bus, we will we start loading from the back and then move from the, from the front uh, so that students to minimize any passage of students uh, uh, up the aisles. Um, so the, um, know also that the buses will be sanitized between each run. Uh, you had the great benefit of watching that actual process. Um, and I have to thank the school committee for taking the time to ride a school bus and to visit our buildings to see and get a feel for what's happening with the reopening of our buildings. We had a very good demonstration of uh, sanitizing uh, buses with a electrostatic portable hand uh, Held sanitizer. Now, please know that all the products that are used, whether it's by the bus transportation company, we supply those products, or in our schools are all EPA approved. Okay, uh, we wouldn't use anything that is not EPA approved, and they are also approved by the CDC and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Okay, uh, for use. Uh, that sanitization process only took about three minutes and was very effective. The dry time. Uh, particularly with windows open in the bus and the, and the windows will be open, not necessarily all the way, but they will be open to increase airflow, which is very important uh, uh, with COVID-19, that uh, the windows will be open slightly and the dry time is about four, about four minutes for the uh, 
sanitizing uh, applications. So that's so we're very pleased uh, with that. Um, so I would ask once again if you have any questions, any specifics on logistics, uh, take a look at the reopening plan. Lunches, bag lunches will be available and they will be free. Uh, the Department of Agriculture has approved a waiver for school systems across the country to provide lunches to students. Uh, we just confirmed that with our school food service director, Colleen Wallace, again today. So that just, just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, opening information just to get everyone started, and uh, then we'll get into a routine. And um, if there are any particular questions as this week goes forward and next week, We'll be glad to answer those. And we know there will be questions uh, because it's, um, it's been one of the most complex planning processes that any of us have ever been involved with. And so we know there'll be a few rough edges. We know there'll be some adjust adjustments that will need to be made, but um, we'll look at everything and every comment that a parent or a, or a student uh, makes uh, that uh, might help us uh, make a revision to anything that might be necessary. So with that, um, I just want to wish everyone the best of luck because we are ready. Um, questions on anything so far? I know we have a number of, of items under reopening. So questions so far about buses or um, lunches, things like that? Two Avery? questions, yep. one on each. Um, bus routes, um, are they posted? And the, cur the ones that are posted say last year, but they're actually, they're still this year's. That's correct. Um, That's so just follow along with whatever's That's on right. the bus route. Registration is still open. Yeah. People can mm -hmm. buy passes at any time online. Um, so that was my bus question. Uh, food question is Colleen sent out a wonderful email letting us know about all that. Is breakfast truly available or is that? Um, I don't, I don't believe we're going to be offering that. Uh, Her letter included free breakfast and I just wanted to clarify if that was an option here, or if we're just going to do the lunches. Well, well I, I'm going to have to seek clarification on, unless you you know that uh, Ingrid with um, talking with Colleen. For families that truly really need it, it, it's our obligation and, and desire to provide breakfast. Okay, uh, but they should get a hold of their so building administrator yes. or Colleen. That's yes. that's correct. Building administrator. Yes, and I believe Colleen has, um, which I'm sure was included in the letter, um, you know, the links sign up for yes mm -hmm. yes okay um, question from from the public on buses have the buses been counted to avoid overcrowding our route has always had two or three kids per seat so how can the routes be the same well please keep in mind that only half the students at any one time are, um, are going to be attending school and so uh, plus we we also have a lot of parents who in the survey have stated that they will be driving their, their child uh, to school and not riding the bus. And so, um, you know, we've looked at the routes. We, we covered that with the bus uh, dispatcher uh, today, Renee D. And uh, we feel that there'll be excellent numbers on, this, on school buses. Yeah, Gloria, driving. Mm -hmm. um, so normally we have about 3,300 riders. Mm -hmm. um, right now we have just under 1,300 riders. So we're down 2,000 riders as is. And then when you take into account the uh, 25 to 30% of students that are uh, participating in remote, fully remote learning, we really do feel we have the capacity. It, it does sound like um, a lot more parents will be driving students. So even though there are a portion of our students are fully remote learning academy and we all only have half people in the building, I would absolutely encourage patience, um, especially these first weeks as everyone is learning new routines. There are new arrival and dismissal procedures at all schools. Those arrival and dismissal procedures are designed to keep students safe. Um, often at the elementary schools, we saw that that uh, students will be uh, entering in different ways. Sometimes path patterns are occurring um, in different ways than they have in the past. So please have patience. Please check all the communications from your building principal. And please, please have patience with other drivers. We absolutely want kids to be safe. And 
uh, for staff members who are entering the building to be safe as well. So please, please, please use caution when dropping students off at schools. Um, yep. Sorry, if I could just yep. piggyback on that real quickly. Um, that was part of the rationale to keep the um, routes the same right now um, so that we really can understand the capacity um, and that we would have extra buses to deploy if a bus fills up. Um, we have a great transportation manager who's really on top of this, has a lot of experience with routing and is working with D, but also the pods were just finalized this weekend and today. So uh, we just gave the bus company all that information. Um, I mean, we've given them various renditions, but the, they just got the final information today. So yes, I think um, there will be a learning curve and we will adjust as necessary. We're obviously not going to send a bus around with one or two children only in it. So um, over the weeks, the routes may change slightly to um, see some efficiencies and really um, not overcrowd the buses, but also make sure that um, you know, we're, we're getting our value. Uh, Valerie. Phil, can you just answer um, whether were, were we able to acquire any bus monitors? No, we were not successful with that, uh, Valerie. That was a, um, uh, we advertised several different times and uh, that type of labor is just, just not there. I know the, uh, we talked with the bus company uh, periodically to say, look, uh, would you try? And they said, we don't have any success hiring uh, bus monitors. So that, uh, you know, we were fortunate that there were low numbers on, uh, on most of the buses so that that should not not be an issue. Uh, that, you know, the, the, the students I know will be well behaved on the bus. Uh, you know, the bus driver will nicely explain to them to just please stay seated where you're seated in the uh, in the bus, and um, we don't anticipate any any issues with that. Bill, on a related note, if a bus driver has to quarantine. Um, what's the backup plan for that? Because obviously you need a special licensure for uh, to drive a operated yeah, vehicle like that. Yeah, the bus company will have to um, will have to bring in a substitute driver, and uh, you know certainly all of those have to have a uh, a school bus transportation licensure. You just can't bring any you know anyone in certainly, so that uh, you know the, the supply of, of Bus drivers, uh, substitute drivers, is not great, but um, D has always been able to work that out. Thanks. Um, we we have had a couple of requests. I don't know if if it's been taken care of or if we can do it technologically. But is it possible to turn on closed captioning um, for anyone at home who's having there's a hard time? There's no automated Zoom closed captioning, unfortunately. It would have to be done manually, or you can link it with other systems. That's something we can look into uh, bringing to future meetings. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that feedback from people at home. We will absolutely try and speak up and speak clearly. Um, we're all dealing with new challenges, um, and we'll see how this system works. And if this system doesn't work well, and if, if people are having difficulty hearing us, we definitely do not want to decrease accessibility to our meetings in any way. So please let us know if you are having a difficult time hearing, and we will try and make some technological adjustments um, or otherwise. Um, we definitely want to be accessible to everyone. Can I ask one more transportation? Yep. Um, Bill, will you be sending out either a, a message or somehow communicating to people now that the pods are done um, tomorrow's virtual but Wednesday I'm not sure that parents have had a clear communication on transportation and plan that it's the same bus routes as last year um, we're all hearing it and I just want to make sure that it is pushed out to parents yes uh, in fact I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a, a video we'll do a connect ed uh, call referencing the video and, awesome. uh, on some of this reopening information and uh, and the fact that the bus routes will be the same we just you know we had a meeting in here for about an hour and a half this afternoon and after going around and around we determined that the best thing to do is, is just to keep keep the routes the same knowing that there might be some fine-tuning that might be necessary over the next two weeks and and that is not uh, unusual we always do have some some tuning of the bus routes so that information will definitely be going out and is it also, is it we holding to what Jen Piper, I think we had heard earlier, that 
you need to be picked up and dropped off at the same location. That we're not going to allow play dates or anything else. Unfortunately, that does hamper child care in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if we need to just make yes. sure we can clarify that for yep. parents. Uh, we'll do that, and um, because that's very important in terms of maintaining everyone's health and safety. So. Correct. Um, we. We already touched on this a bit with our um, annual building tours. Um, school committee had an opportunity over the last two weeks um, to go into all of our buildings. Um, our principals graciously took some time out of their extraordinarily busy schedules uh, to take us on a tour around. We were able to see setups of uh, the classrooms. We were able to see some of the new arrival and dismissal procedures. Uh, we were able to see how each building is, is handling some of the unique challenges um, brought forth. Uh, we were able to see the, the caring rooms where uh, a student would be taken if they were exhibiting symptoms and uh, needed to be dismissed to a parent. Uh, we were able to talk to some of our, our school nurses uh, we were able to see some of our staff that was in the building uh, preparing the classrooms and uh, doing professional development. It was really wonderful to be, to be back in the buildings, to see life back in the buildings. Um, I think our, our principals, as much as they were extraordinarily busy, um, I think they enjoyed uh, taking us around and um, bringing their buildings back to life, I think, is, is a very exciting time. So um, traditionally, I know we've got a, a huge agenda, and I'm sure we're already running behind, um, but it, traditionally we do go around and, and see if anyone uh, on school committee does have some comments about building tours, um, and if, if anybody has thoughts to share. But my big takeaway is it was just amazing to see the positive energy in the buildings and lots of gratitude to our principals who took the time to uh, show us around. Traditionally, we do these tours later in the fall once school's going, but I think it was super, super important for us to see um, what buildings are looking like as we prepare to bring students back to them. So uh, I'll be brief, Gloria. Oh. One thing that I observed um, that was just astonishing was the thought and consideration that went into <coughs> how the children and students will be walking around the building. So particularly the one ways, the, uh, the markers, the keeping your distance, it's just, it, it's tremendous. It's stuff that, you know, we all don't think much of when we're walking through Market Basket, but so many of these buildings aren't a big square, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, I think it was, um, God, I think it was Mrs. Canelli who was saying that, you know, she, she set up the one ways and then uh, she, she actually followed it out and then eventually realized that to turn around, she had to walk out a window. <laughs> so anyways, had to go back to the drawing board. So kudos to the, uh, the staff for putting the thought into that. And I hope it works. It, uh, we did try it ourselves, so uh, at least in one of the buildings. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, other other comments or observations? Alicia? Um, just to add on to what everyone else said, I was also very appreciative that the administrators invited us back um, later in the, the fall when the buildings are occupied so that we can see how these things are actually playing out because I think a lot of this is so theoretical for so many people to be able to see the buildings, to be able to see how they're actually living and breathing will help us better understand how we got to this point in the planning process, what's working, what's not, um, and understand you know, what it looks like for our staff on the ground. So I was very appreciative that they made that offer. Other comments, Valerie? Yeah, just as a newbie um, who has only been in one building for my student and then a few other buildings for like uh, recreation activities and stuff. Um, but it was awesome to see all nine buildings, I think like in such a, like we had this like kind of special vantage point, right? To be like a fresh set of eyes to see all nine buildings in kind of a short period of time. Um, and, you know, I've been hearing like, oh, each building has its own energy. And it, that was very true to me and very clear to see um, and one thing I tried to explain on a message I posted on my Facebook page was that you 
it's hard to just, a picture just didn't do it, it justice, right? Like just conversations with these principals really just showed that they have thought through every decision, every trickle down decision. That, I mean, just the sleepless nights and the hard work and dedication was really hard to convey to someone else that wasn't there, but you could really feel it in the tour. Chris? And just to tack on to the end of that, I know it, this is not the normal way to start a year and it feels like, you know, we're getting information the day before and we're not used to that. But understand that the, the administrators, they're feeling that too. This is not the way they want to operate and it really is a, a function of where we're at and what it's taken to get to this point. And, um, and that goes back to the original message of just a little bit of like grace and forbearance and patience. Um, we will get there. Um, but at the same time, don't hesitate to reach out if there are questions and concerns. And I just want to thank all of you again for taking that time because it was so important that you touched it, you saw it, you experienced it. Uh, and as you said, Valerie, it, 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 it speaks so much more than just seeing a picture of something. Mm -hmm. So thank you for taking that time. It, it, and there were, there were really some amazingly thoughtful touches. Um, you know, a, a number of a number of teachers had had uh, family pictures up because they thought it was really important for their students to see their face unmasked. And um, one of the schools was doing a bulletin board that showed, you know, your teacher masked and your teacher unmasked. And um, I thought there there were just really creative ways that that our teachers are really making our buildings the warm welcoming places mm -hmm. they are and i know a lot of parents have had some anxiety about about whether the the masks would feel like like a barrier and uh, i really found on these tours wandering around y you quickly forgot that that you were wearing a mask because you were so excited to be back in the buildings and see people and talk to people and um and it, it it was not it, it was not the barrier that I think some people uh, fear that it could be um, and I, I just I, I I want everyone to to you know think positive thoughts for those early days because I, I think I think children are going to be ple pleasantly surprised at, at all of the thought that has gone into preparing the buildings for um, for those who are able to return in person and all of the thought that has gone into creating a welcoming and warm virtual environment for our students who will be joining us remotely. Um, and um, beauty of technology, I have live feedback from a viewer that um, if you are having difficulty with the sound on whatever way you are watching us, try westfordcat.com and uh, the feed on westfordcat.com is apparently um, better for this viewer. So you might wanna just try a different way to watch us if you are having difficulty with the sound. Um, should um, are we ready, Bill, to move on to um, the air quality update? Yes, we are. Yes. Great. Uh, Chris, if you could let Paul. Uh, Paul should be joining us. Mm -hmm. But what I'd uh, like to do right now with our facilities director, Paul Fox, is explain to the parents in the community what we have done this summer to provide safe, healthy conditions in our buildings for students and, and staff you know over the last uh, few weeks you've seen stories on the news about uh, teachers or employees not wanting to go into buildings um, well our schools uh, many of you know have a reputation for being among the cleanest if not the cleanest in the entire area and we take great pride in providing health healthy safe conditions to uh, to our students and our staff. So as you know, we have nine schools. Uh, Chris, is there any way to bring up that slide sure. to a presentation? And uh, we'll be on the second, second page right now. Uh, if we could have, yeah, there we go. We have nine schools, six elementaries, two middles, and, and a high school. And uh, they all have operating HVAC systems. Uh, they were built to specific specifications when the schools were, were constructed and in some cases upgraded. 
Uh, there are a number of different operating technologies, and I'll have Paul uh, Fox, our facilities director, explain <coughs> a little bit more about that. But our, our work this summer has not only focused on personal protection equipment, uh, safety protocols, cleaning and disinfecting, but also in making sure that we have well operating HVAC systems. Now the state of Massachusetts granted every school system $225 per student for, to address some uh, COVID-19 issues such as <coughs> repairs, uh, personal protection equipment. We received uh, $1,057,000. Of that, over $400,000 of that money that came through the state has been spent on our HVAC systems. And, um, I'm very pleased to say that we've done an awful lot of uh, work. Uh, so if we could do the next slide, Chris. We know that uh, from the CDC, from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and, and other infectious disease professionals, that the distancing, uh, the capacity reductions, the masks, okay, uh, the hand sanitizing are extraordinarily important in reducing the risk of the transmission of COVID-19. Uh, I'd like the parents to keep in mind that a couple of months ago, the Department of Education sent out some guidance indicating that three feet of distancing between students was acceptable. Well, we were not willing to accept that. And we have consistently stated that we our distancing factor, as you've seen as you've toured the buildings, is six feet and nothing under that. Uh, we just, um, uh, we have complied with the CDC guidelines of six feet of uh, distancing because close contact is defined by the CDC is anyone who is under six feet to uh, a person who might test positive for longer than 15 minutes. So if we went to, with a three feet of distancing, that would immediately <coughs> put people within close contact. So we've taken every precaution to exceed any of the requirements and guidance from the, uh, the state and work with the DPH and the CDC requirements. So we've got masks, we've got gloves, we've got shields, we've got protective coverings, we have goggles, we have protective eyeglasses, we have uh, hand sanitizing stations, uh, we have sanitizing gel in every, uh, every classroom. Uh, we um, uh, have adopted uh, cleaning and sanitizing procedures that are uh, guided by the CDC and the Occupational Safety Health Administration, OSHA, uh, custodians have been trained. We have moved a night custodian down to the day shift. So we have two custodians during the day when students and staff are in the building to clean and disinfect commonly touched surfaces. Uh, that disinfecting will continue after hours each, each day, particularly in, in the lavatories, okay, uh, throughout the building. So uh, they know what to do and, and how to do it. We will have logs that uh, we will uh, fill out in terms of, particularly with the bathrooms, uh, how often it's, uh, they've been cleaned and sanitized during the day, and keeping in mind that the students will only be in <coughs> an early release schedule, but it's still important to keep those facilities extraordinarily clean. So we've done all of the preparation in terms of the, the training, the purchase of personal protection equipment, the distancing and the capacity factors. And so what we have focused on also very heavily during the summer is uh, repairs and fine tuning to our HVAC systems. Okay, we have uh, we've worked on those in our schools. We have purchased uh, CO2 detectors because we didn't have an air quality test done in every school, uh, school building that assessed the CO2 level. So, you know, some people have said to me, well, what did you do that for because the building's unoccupied? Because we needed a baseline measurement from which to assess uh, any further fine tuning of the HVAC systems. You see, ambient air has a uh, CO2 content of between 300 and 400 parts per million. The air quality tests to measure for CO2 in our buildings during the summer was between three, uh, 320, 25 or thereabouts and about 550 parts per million. Now, occupy the buildings with students and staff, and obviously those, those levels will elevate. What we wanna make sure of is we don't reach a level, a threshold level, uh, that is of the 1,000 to 1,100 parts per million, because that's when you get an indication that the airflow in the building, the 
the air intake and the exhausting. In other words, the air exchange is not adequate. Okay. To that end, what we've done is we've purchased portable handheld carbon dioxide detectors. And our custodians will be going through the building daily, assessing the CO2 level to make sure that the air exchange in every classroom is sound, okay? And that the air isn't stagnant, all right? Um, because that airflow, that air exchange, is one of the important aspects of mitigating any transmission of the COVID virus. So we have tuned up our HVAC systems. We have portable CO2 detectors. We have purchased for those interior classrooms, for some of the special education classrooms, for some of our nurses, uh, for all of our nurses' clinics, for the caring room, for the guidance offices, those small contained, uh, self-contained offices that are oftentimes in the interior of a building that don't have uh, operating windows. We have purchased highly effective uh, medical grade air, air purifiers for those offices because our students will invariably be in those areas also for our REACH program, for our special education, for our preschool. Those air purifiers are going in those areas also. And so we've, we've tried to take every measure possible to keep staff and students um, as safe as possible with a, an appropriate air exchange. We have pressures, there's been a lot of controversy around the country about what's called MERV 13 filters. It's a higher capacity, filtration capacity filter. Well, we've had these on order for about six weeks now with the original indication that we were going to have a two-week delivery. Um, you know, obviously, there's a shortage in the country right now, a nationwide shortage, because a lot of the material that goes into the MERV 13 filters is the same material that is used in the N95 masks. And so a lot of it has been reallocated to the medical industry. So uh, we're still awaiting them. As soon as uh, they arrive, we will be installing them. We have MERV 8 filters in our uh, HVAC equipment uh, right now, uh, which have uh, done a fine job uh, of filtration in, in the past. It's just that uh, we have promised to upgrade to the MERV 13s as that extra measure of safety to our staff and our students. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul to explain to the parents a little bit about how our HVAC systems operate, because I, I want people to un understand uh, how they operate and the fact that our buildings are safe by reason of quality, uh, good quality air, excellent quality air. So, Paul? Thank you, Bill. Uh, first, too, I'd like to take a moment and recognize the facility staff, really specifically the custodians, the maintenance personnel, and Jacqueline Studley, my uh, administrator. They've just done an amazing job uh, this summer, in particular, always going above and beyond. For a lot of the items that Bill just mentioned, it would not be possible and we would not be in the position where we are without them. Um, so, uh, with that quick recognition, um, there are essentially two types of systems that we have running throughout our nine buildings, and really, it's pretty much either or. This first system, and again, this is just a very high-level overview, um, there is a system where it's essentially run on a bunch of unit ventilators. And these unit ventilators are placed typically on the perimeter of the buildings. Um, this can be seen at the Abbott, at the uh, Day School, and at the Nab Nasset School. The Robinson School also has a unit ventilator type HVAC system. However, um, their unit vents are actually placed uh, in the roof on that one level building. So essentially the way that this system works, as you can see on the lower left portion of the diagram on the screen, is that the outside air enters the building uh, 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 right there um, in that spot. And, and right there at, at that spot, there is a damper there. And one of the guidances that CDC and other agencies have recommended is to try to increase that damper as much as possible. So something that we've gone around doing with all these units is to increase them and open them to 100%. So what we really want to do is focus and emphasize the amount of outside fresh air that is entering our building at all times. So essentially the fresh air comes through, it gets filtered out, and that first uh, that filter right there is essentially filtering out items uh, like smog and other elements that are in the uh, uh, outside air, dust, debris. Um, it gets pushed through this supply fan and ultimately through a coil, depending upon the season, and uh, the coil will warm up the air if necessary, and then ultimately push through the building. The second part of this system is the return air segment. 
This return error also has a little bit of a damper that's associated with it. Um, and it basically designs at this moment to mix the return air with the outside air. And this is mainly done for efficiency purposes. You can imagine during the winter time, um, with the mixing of it, it can certainly save on uh, utility uh, bills. However, that's something that we're really not uh, interested in this year. What we're really interested in is maximizing the amount of outside air that's entering the building and maximizing the amount of return air that's just exhausting out of the building and minimizing that mixing of air. So what we've done there is with that damper too, we've tried to set it and manually uh, override it to allow and accommodate for as much important of that return air to not mix with that outside air as possible. Ultimately, these systems are supplemented by further exhaust systems and depending upon the building, there can be other HVAC systems that support uh, uh, the system. But this is essentially just the background information for those four schools that were just mentioned. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the second uh, of, of the two systems that are primarily used to occupy our building um, is this one. And this is done by ducted work. Uh, these are the air handling units. Essentially, when you look up in these classrooms um, and these buildings, you'll see a series of vents. One of the vents that you'll see is a supply vent, and the other one is a return air vent. So uh, the way in which these systems work is in the upper left portion of this diagram, there's the symbol OA. That stands for outdoor air. Outdoor air is first passed through the yellow uh, highlighted uh, filter right there, again, filtering out things such as smog and debris and dust. It passes through a set of uh, cooling or heating coils, depending upon the unit, unit's capabilities and the season uh, that we're in. It gets pushed through the supply pan and ultimately out as supplied air into the uh, room that is requesting it. Um, also in that room, as mentioned before, one of those vents is a return air vent system. So the return air is circulated through that building or through that area, through this vent, and ultimately what we're also again here being tasked with doing is try to make it and maximize it. That way the exhaust air is at 100%. So that is something that we've done. Again, the outside air coming in, we've opened up the dampers to accommodate for 100% uh, outside air coming in, and we've opened up the dampers to accommodate for 100% exhaust air coming out. The purple arrow pointing north at that diagram, this is again the point in which this unit wants to function as efficiency. But it, the way in which, again, these units are designed is to mix some of that uh, return air fan running through that, uh, right just north of there, through that filter, and to mix with the outside air, again, done for efficiency purposes. What we've done here is we've tried to reduce this as much as possible. Again, since this is a very high-level overview, there's multiple factors that come into play. Some of the other elements besides just dampers are entropy wheels, um, as well as other types of systems that make it complicated to reduce this 100%. Ideally, it would be a giant steel door that we could just shut right there. Unfortunately, it's not. But what we're really ultimately after is the old adage that solution to pollution is dilution, and that is truly what we're able to do with both of these systems. We're really just able to continue to push in a lot of fresh air into the building, and exhaust as much of that air as we can. Um, so again, I'm very pleased with the amount of work and I'm very thankful for the amount of work that we've been able to allocate uh, this summer. And again, it's just so grateful for the amount of support that the maintenance staff and the custodians have done. Uh, when outside contractors have entered the building, they're always impressed by how well these uh, units are maintained by our internal staff. So uh, that's just a very high level uh, overview and background of the way in which these two systems work. Chris, if we go to the next slide. So we have um, we've done a lot of work. We've done a lot of work on our HVAC systems, as Paul just uh, indicated. One of the other uh, mitigating strategies for reducing the possibility of the transmission of the virus that has uh, been uh, articulated by the CDC and uh, other health agencies is opening windows and doors, something very simple, and increasing the airflow. Um, you know, we, uh, we have air purifiers, as, as I've indicated, you know, looking at that right-hand column, the additional health and safety measures. Uh, we've done the air quality tests. We have the CO2 monitors. Um, we do have uh, N95 masks for adults. Those are optional. 
and um, would require a staff member to really consult with their their physician, uh, their healthcare expert, because uh, those N95 masks are not for everyone, and certainly they, they are not for for children. Okay, um, and we purchased 200 air purifiers, and once again, and, and I'll have Paul talk a little bit more about the air purifiers in a minute. One of the one of the key elements, though, also is a portable electrostatic uh, sanitizers that you saw operate on the school bus, but that we have for, for every uh, every school building also. And after hours, those surfaces will be sanitized by the custodians. Once again, with an EPA approved uh, material being dispensed uh, that is safe, uh, but also a material that according to CDC will adequately kill the virus. Okay. Uh, and any any possibility of any virus on a, on a surface. So, uh, in the next slide, Chris, uh, just a, a picture, quick picture of the handheld CO2 detectors that the custodians will be using on a daily basis. Uh, once again, uh, kind of the threshold between good air and and stale air is about a thousand to eleven hundred parts per million of carbon dioxide. Uh, please note, not carbon monoxide, but carbon dioxide. <laughs> and so the, you know, we will keep a constant monitor, uh, monitoring of the levels in all classrooms to make sure that the airflow is, uh, is strong, is robust, and keeping the uh, CO2 levels at uh, reasonable and safe levels. Chris, if we can go maybe two slides over to the air purifiers. Uh, Paul, would you like to talk about the air purifiers for just a minute, please? Yeah, absolutely. And to uh, Bill, if I can uh, speak a little bit more on the CO2, I think one of our significance um, uh, that we wanted to point out there was that if you ultimately you crowd these classrooms and if our systems are not working, they will certainly show that the CO2 levels will rise. So something that we have implemented and are working on fully uh, administrating is that once a week with either the principal or the head custodian or a combination of the two, we will go around with those CO2 detectors and actively monitor the levels of those classrooms to make sure that we're coming nowhere close to those numbers. Um, ultimately, if our HVAC system was not working, we would see a spike, but as of right now, and with the baseline, we're not anticipating uh, any issues. But like I said, we're being proactive. We're gonna continue to actively monitor that. And, and the air purifiers are, in fact, one of the mitigating techniques that we would immediately implement um, if we saw a spike in one of those numbers. Um, so, uh, for the air purifiers, we purchased 100 of both uh, the Austin air purifier, which is the uh, unit that is demonstrated in this picture. Um, it was the first unit to receive a uh, quote-unquote kill claim for uh, the COVID-19 virus. Um, one of the important things to point out here is that the coronavirus is uh, cited at being 0.12 microns. Uh, this unit itself has the ability to um, and to capture um, and kill uh, uh, microns as small as 0.1. So it will be uh, effective against uh, COVID-19. Um, the second of which uh, units that we've also purchased um, is the Defender Series. This is one of the better uh, FDA uh, class two uh, medical devices um, that is recognized um, and it can filter 99.99% of particles down to 0.1 microns. So again, uh, leading us in the direction that this should be effective as well uh, against COVID-19. So we wanted to give you a, a brief overview of uh, the work that we have accomplished during the summer. Uh, we have always taken very seriously our, our obligation to parents and to our staff provide clean and safe facilities, and particularly at, at this point in time. And so with that, I'll be glad to answer any of your questions. Um, also, if any parent has any questions over the next uh, few days or tonight, uh, we'll be glad, to, either Paul or I will be glad, uh, glad to answer them. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you to the entire custodial maintenance facility staff. Um, I know uh, a ton of work has gone in uh, this summer on preparing the buildings and ensuring that they're safe. Um, I appreciated uh, better understanding how these systems work. Um, I appreciated seeing really the, the layers of safety that are being provided 
to our students and staff. Um, and, and it was helpful to understand that the HVAC systems, while in a traditional year we might adjust them or, or calibrate them in a way that uh, lends itself to efficiency and energy efficiency, um, we can we can adjust those settings mm -hmm. and um, we can recalibrate them to really perhaps be less energy efficient but to maximize safety and I, I think that's, that's very right. helpful for, for parents to understand so uh, may I just say yeah. I pick up on that Glenn. I think yeah. that's an important point uh, that, that you mentioned also because usually the systems are on a cycle and after in uh, unoccupied times of the day and night cycle down but what we're doing is overriding and keeping the systems going 24-7. Thank you for, for all the thoughts that's, that's kind of gone into this. Um, questions from the committee? Valerie? Is, is there a way to um, share that presentation? Yes, we can, we can, uh, we'll put this on our, uh, on our website. Great. And just a quick question about the diagrams. I, I don't know if it's a question for Paul or not, um, but the the diagrams of the systems, there's like a yellow, um, on both there's like a, a yellow marking. Is that where the filter goes? Yes, that's that's correct, Valerie. So like on, um, I'm gonna use the word, the wrong words, but the second type, <laughs> um, there was two yellow markings so that w those systems get two MERV filters, is that right? That's that's correct, exactly okay. correct. Okay, yeah. thanks. Other, other questions? Okay. Um, uh, we were also going to provide the community with a uh, staffing update. I know we've had uh, a number of staff members who for various reasons, health reasons and others, um, may have needed to, to take leaves during this time. Um, thank you and welcome, welcome to any you know, new staff members who may be joining us or long-term mm -hmm. substitutes who are joining us to help us during this time. Um, but uh, do we have a, an update on uh, staffing? Well, the, the update that I can provide you is I, I checked with the principals uh, this afternoon and uh, we have adequate staff uh, in every building to open. Uh, as you recall, about two weeks ago, uh, there were some questions at, at Westford Academy. We've been able to do some uh, hiring uh, to fill in for those people who will be on leaves. Um, most of those leaves are under the Family First Corona Response Act, um, and uh, so we we are ready to ready to be able to uh, welcome our students and educate them. Carrie, any do uh, you have any any comment on that at all? Anything that you that I haven't covered that um, you might think is important? No, I just think the principals kind of took a shotgun approach to getting interviews in and th what. <coughs> it typically takes multiple <coughs> weeks. Actually, they did in 24, 48 hours, and they were just working so hard and tirelessly to, to cover, and I think we are at a great spot. Yeah. I really have to thank the principals and, and certainly Jen Burke, our HR person. They have worked extraordinarily hard to make sure that we were filling in gaps where people were taking leaves. Uh, it, it wasn't easy in some, uh, some areas, but uh, we made it happen. I'm very grateful for their work. Absolutely. Th thank you to Jen Burke in Human Resources who has been working overtime mm -hmm. and thank you to all of our principals and, and their leadership team um, and, and uh, just fantastic news um, that uh, Principal Antonelli and the, the team at Westford Academy was, was really able to, to pull things together um, to provide the, the full range of classes and options that our students um, are so um, are, are, are so fortunate to enjoy um, and being able to, to offer that full range of classes um, in this situation is really quite extraordinary so um, kudos to Principal Antonelli and that, that entire team. Um, I, I believe we also, I mean maybe this is a good time, I know we were also um, really looking to put out a call to the community for substitutes because a, as we've discussed, it, if anyone is experiencing symptoms um, that are ambiguous in any nature, um, if, if they're not feeling well and they're just not certain, um, 
they, they shouldn't be coming in. And, and under normal circumstances, you know, uh, we would all perhaps go into, go into work or go into school when we're feeling a little under the weather. But uh, we're, in a new, we're in a new realm now and we shouldn't be doing that. So we are going to be in need of, a, of additional substitutes. So um, I know Principal Antonelli has put out a, a successful call. Um, if, if people in, in the community are interested and able in helping out as substitutes, how would they do that? Uh, they contact the HR, they can go to our website under employment opportunities. Um, as you said, the, uh, Jim Antonelli was very <coughs> successful, he had about 16 or 17 potential candidates. Uh, so today he did, uh, did communicate with the principals to please in your, in your next newsletter, make sure because there's something to be said about up close and personal in your own school community, to put out that call at all levels and uh, see what we can garner for substitutes. Uh, I, I know often my my students um, were always very excited when sometimes uh, young people came in to substitute um, and and certainly if if we have uh, young alumni of Westford Academy who, who are back in Westford and are looking for for some additional employment um, I think it's a great way for, for them to pay it forward to the next the next generation of Westford students um, and they're absolutely welcome to be back in our buildings and serve as substitutes so if you do know anyone who fits that category please uh, send them in the direction of Principal Antonelli I'm, I'm sure he will appreciate seeing some familiar faces as young alums to welcome them back as substitute <coughs> teachers to uh, help our, our school system during this time um, I know we already just, oh, sorry. oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to ask if we could yep. back up. I did see a question yep. um, oh, sure. on error filtering. Um, I mean, the, the, uh, I'm trying to figure out, oh, with the filters, how often do they need to be cleaned or changed? The filters are changed um, at least twice a year, uh, Chris. Uh, we'll, we'll keep monitoring to see if we need to change them more often, but um, twice, sometimes three times uh, during the course of the, uh, now what I'm talking about here is the 10 month school period, not, not the entire 12 month. They're all changed over the summer also, but a couple, two or three times during the school year itself. And something I, I've had a couple of people ask is just clarity um, on mask breaks. And I think this applies to students and staff. Like what, what are the guidelines for staff you know, if there are no students around, can staff take off their masks? The uh, guidelines are the mask breaks are going to be taken uh, outside, okay, until we have the uh, MERV 13 filters. Um, they may still be taken outside uh, after that. Um, and uh, basically about once every 90 minutes, uh, if I recall correctly, we, you know, uh, discussions, they'll be uh, allowed to go out uh, and have a mask break. Which, which is very important. I mean, we can, all of us can only spend so much time in these, and so it's, it's good for them to get outside, but it's also good for them to be able to remove, uh, remove these. So that, that will be a, a common occurrence at all levels during the, uh, during the school day. Okay. And if it's rainy, Bill, there'll be room to do the mass breaks where? Well, if it's uh, raining, you know, uh, there's some question in terms of uh, having canopies and tents. Um, and you know some of our buildings have overhangs in, in the uh, entrance entrances. Uh, so as long as the number of students and staff is is reasonable, uh, we can use some of those areas. You know we might ask them to bring you know bring them umbrellas. Uh, you know we just we'd like to get them outside as much as uh, as much as possible. Might be a good year to invest in a in a in a good rain slicker because um, we do want students outside. We do want them uh, having having that mask break outside and and getting getting some fresh air and taking that break before going back into the buildings. So, um, and you know, not only just being able to take these off, just being able to see their friends, their classmates, and their teacher without without one of these on makes all the difference in the world. And Bill, for the younger kids too, that will also be a snack break for the younger, younger kids, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
and certainly since since you know we do have students who will be on the move and maybe maybe going outside um, to, to take a snack break we're absolutely encouraging um, those elementary school kids to bring just easy munching things um, not, nothing nothing complicated nobody needs to bring a fourth four course meal just a simple snack that will get them through the day that, that, that's a, a nice bite-sized snack um, would be very helpful. I think the suggestion was to not nothing that needs utensils. Right. <laughs> yep. No, no yogurts. Yeah. Keep yeah. keep it simple. Leave the bento box yeah, at right. home. You don't, you don't need that. For and, and don't share. Don't share. Don't share. Yeah. That's right. yep. That's right. Yeah. We encourage sharing, but not but not this year. <laughs> <laughs> not this year. Don't share your snacks. Um, um, pod updates. Well, we want to apologize to uh, the parents for. Uh, we had a, a, a data issue that um, this was not the responsibility of the of the principals, the Robinson, the Christopher, and the Blanchard schools. That's where we had the issue, and that held up the uh, publication of the pods for us. So we we just noticed that last week. Uh, it was something that unfortunately was pretty much unavoidable. Uh, what we have done over the summer, I just if I can hold up something in, in front of me, we worked on on. Every single school uh, has, a, has a district. Now, this is the Nab Babbitt district. And so we were breaking them down into pods based on uh, geographic considerations and also uh, taking a look at the numbers of students. But the importance of this is that pods had to match going from K to 2 to 3 to 5 to 6 to 8 to 9 to 12 so that in a family, the greatest extent possible and there are some exceptions okay there are some one-offs where you know a student might live in a different part of the town with a different uh, parent but if you look at um, at the Westwood Academy map here uh, the pod A's were in the top and the bottom of the town pod B sort of a circuitous route all around the the town but those match the feeding schools, the K to two, three to five, and six to eight. And so what happened is we had a data issue in our student management program for the Robinson, the Christopher and the Blanchard. And so I want to apologize to the parents for, for that occurring. Um, it was pretty much unavoidable. And that was the delay in getting the pods out. Uh, that was a little bit of the delay in, in, in actually making sure we knew that we could go with the transportation routes as we have in the past. So we have finally, um, you know, got all the pods to match. That information has been sent to parents, but uh, our apologies for them coming out a little bit late. It's just something we had not expected at all to happen, but it, it, and it did. And so um, we're in good shape now. And um, th there might, might be, with almost 5,000 students, there might be some shifting here or there after the opening of school, but for the most part, that should be minimal. Um, it, it looks like we have someone who wants to ask a live question, so we'll uh, give this a whirl. Um, <laughs> I, I will. <laughs> I'll turn control to our, our Zoom master, Chris. Thank you for uh, bearing with us as we, we figure out these new options. Actually, I don't see the person oh. in the attendee list. Have we lost our so commenter? I don't think we can do it. OK. If, if we circle back around, um, we will um, figure it out. Um, or if that person is maybe temporarily logged off, if they log back in, um, let us know and put another note in the chat. Yeah. And, and if, if that's not possible, if they want to call, call us in the morning, we'll be glad to answer the question. Yes. I have a quick pod question. Um, so anecdotally, it sounds like the other schools did not have the same data problem, but I did have a couple parents ask me if we've gone back and reviewed to make sure the data is um, accurate at the other schools, because it did sort of seem like it was one string of neighborhoods but you know are the rest of the school data streams correct yes the principals have met together with succeeding grade spans okay. K to two, have met with three to five and six to eight and so um, we feel confident about that okay thank you so gloria i have one over here it's yep. a pod related question that's on uh, Airtable. so 
Carrie, I think this is more for you. If a student is not feeling well and they're in a live pod for that week, but they're well enough, so they're kept at home, but they're well enough to do work, are they able to jump in on the remote pods section? Uh, depending on the level. So if you're talking about Westford Academy, then that is easy to do because their class is going on and is already set up for streaming. Mm -hmm. If it's something where they're um, at the lower levels, we would have them log on in the afternoon if it's the stay-at-home students. Um, there are other things that we could do, but they wouldn't necessarily switch teachers to go into a remote learning academy pod. So, so generally speaking, it would be kind of like a normal absence, except they would have they would have the opportunity to log on with the teacher in the afternoon. Okay, so they just, because I think the question was more geared towards, are they jumping into another class or something? So they would probably just miss the morning after a part of it, and then they'd be able to jump in for, for the, uh, afternoon, the afternoon. Okay. Yes. Great. Yeah. Personal Avery. question, or actually it's been floated around. Bill, does this mean no more snow days? <laughs> ah, interesting question. Uh, I was waiting for that to come up because that is going to be on our very next leadership team. Okay. Because uh, that may mean, it could possibly mean the end of the snow days. We want to we want to talk, talk with the principals about that. I assume in, in, unless there's a loss of power and internet yeah. throughout the, the town. And I believe the commissioner is coming out with some guidance on that right. very soon. He's brought that up a couple of times. Too. We're waiting for that question to <laughs> come up, actually. Yeah. Okay. The senior class will be very disappointed. Right. Well, I, 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 have to, I have to tell you, I go to a, uh, a local hardware store quite often. And that's always one of the questions that uh, one of the students who's at the register will ask me. <laughs> so uh, we're going to put that uh, as a discussion for our leadership team. Great. Um, other other reopening questions before we dare I say move on to a, another topic. Okay. Um, DEI update. Um, I know Chris, you've touched on this before, but uh, um, if you have more. Sure, we share. can talk from the policy subcommittee yep. perspective. Um, the little bit that we dipped our subcommittee toe in the water um, we was to address uh, concerns that have been brought to the committee about blackface. Um, in particular with School Spirit Week at WA, and I know there have been a lot of conversations in the past, so we were joined at our subcommittee meeting by the um, Westford Coalition for Change students. Um, and so it was nice to be able to just kind of hear from them and what they've seen and what they were feeling about that. Um, you know, we looked at it as a, do we want to take on new policy? Do we need to change existing policies? I'll say, and again, this is one meeting and it's still early and I think there's a lot more conversation that can be had, but the sense that we had was that it should be covered by existing policy. We have student harassment policy, we have staff harassment policy, and we have dress code policy. And um, while I don't have them up in front of me, the takeaway from those is that, yes, if this is something that makes somebody that, that it could be construed in, a, in an offensive way, um, you know, then that's a violation of those policies. So, and I welcome Alicia and Valerie to jump in, but you know, the sense we have at this point is that we feel like um, blackface would be prohibited by existing policy. Um, and we would leave it to the administration to work with the students and, and um, find constructive ways for them to not uh, even get close to that line where anybody could even construe it. And I think that's a, a lot of the nuances you know, the discussion of, well, what if it's half, you know, and I think, I think Valerie it was you that said it best, that we can't be assured that somebody, you know, it's isn't, not for us to say. it's not for us to say that, you know, half of a face black is, is fine. Um, so I think there's probably still and more. I just want to, I just want to finish, we'll, that, hand it over to you. finish that thought that, you know, it's, we are the policy making body. I don't mean like we, it's not for us to say it's, I mean that it's not for us to say because we're white. It's whether or not 50% of 
black face paint is offensive is not for me to say. Like, I can't say whether that's offensive to me or not. Um, that's for a student of color to decide. Um, so we're just trying to look for a way to avoid that altogether and have maybe a creative solution um, with the senior class that, that avoids that scenario altogether. Alicia, did you have any, anything to add? Um, I, I think my only addition would be that I want to remind everyone that this is going to be an ongoing conversation and conversations around these topics are never easy and they're never comfortable, but it is going to be an ongoing conversation. Um, and there will be more policy meetings, and I know, Bill, you're going to update us on some DEI stuff. There's the town DEI. We need to maintain an open and respectful dialogue with each other when it comes to subjects like this. Um, it's not going to be solved overnight, and it's not going to be solved by three people on a subcommittee. And I think the more buy-in we have from, you know, a diverse group of people, the better understanding we will have of the issue. and the more concrete solutions we'll come up with. Um, Alicia touched on it. Um, certainly the Board of Selectmen um, has uh, taken, uh, sorry, the Select Board has uh, taken steps to form a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee that would look at both town and school um, policy, policies and practices and how um, those could be enhanced or improved to make Westford a more uh, welcoming community. And, um, and those, that committee is being populated right now for anyone who is interested. You can go to the uh, town website and uh, fill out a citizen's activity form. Um, but I believe that that's very much in the process. I know a number of excellent candidates have already stepped forward to volunteer for that board, and we will be meeting jointly with the select board uh, to make appointments to that committee in uh, the near future. May I just say that uh, in our school department diversity and inclusion uh, team, which we're also going to expand the, the type of the equity also, uh, in the next two weeks we'll be meeting, I'll get an organizational meeting together so we can, we can talk about uh, what we've accomplished in the past in terms of ADL, and Anti-Defamation League training. Uh, we will also uh, talk about um, where we want to proceed forward with that training, but also incorporating the uh, WPAS 8 Can't Wait uh, initiatives. And how exactly uh, do we want to interact with the townwide committee? Because we, we've often talked about expanding the sphere of influence of diversity, inclusion, and equity outside the school system to the community. Um, you know, we, we don't want to dilute ourselves too much, but we have some specific goals to accomplish within the school system. Cur you know, curriculum, question asking, and answering, and the dynamics in classrooms, et cetera, just a small part of it. Uh, and so we're, we're going to uh, ramp it up and get started uh, uh, shortly. Great. Uh, looking, looking forward to those updates. Um, and I'll just reiterate what Alicia said. Absolutely, this is a, a priority for the committee, and it will be um, ongoing efforts um, across the school system and town. Um, and it really, it really does uh, take everyone to make a difference. And and this isn't the job of of one group or one committee or one subcommittee. This this is everybody's job. Um, and and we're all going to to work together in that regard this year um, as a high priority. Um, so you will see this on future agendas as well. Um, enrollment update. Well, as of uh, the end of last week, we had um, 4,718 students. We know that that will increase over the course of the year. Uh, I did uh, put in a uh, table here indicating uh, what our projections were for this this school year and what our actuals are as of September 11th. Um, from grades 3 up, uh, the projections are quite accurate. Um, grades K to 2 are always, always unnerving, quite honestly. And uh, if you recall from past discussions with George Murray, who has done our enrollment projections for about the last 30 years, 
Uh, the reliability of the K and 1 and 2 projections uh, falls off dramatically uh, because of a, a lot of unknowns uh, compared to grades 3 and up where we have an established base of students progressing forward with a um, cohort survival ratio that is calculated each year. And uh, what I do is I pretty much take the last six or seven years of the cohort survival ratio and, uh, and apply that from the progression of students from one grade to the next. So the, the projections are fairly accurate. Uh, for most grades, uh, we're off a little bit with the kindergarten uh, this year. I, uh, I'm, I'm surprised by the enrollment at the Miller School. Uh, the enrollment has dipped in that particular school, and I've had a couple of conversations with Ta Donna Pobuck. Uh, we're going to keep an eye on, on that. Um, we don't anticipate a large increase, but I was surprised at the dip in the enrollment for this uh, upcoming school year in, in that district. So uh, uh, we generally will give you a periodic enrollment update. Uh, we'll give you one uh, for, uh, I'd say, over the next couple of months on a fairly regular basis. And then after that, it's generally in January and then March uh, as we proceed through the remainder of the year. So we'll definitely keep you updated on this. Questions? Um, just a super quick request. Now that our K to twos are technically our pre K to twos, um, I think it would be helpful to ha start including the preschool numbers so that we can better understand building usage, et cetera, as we go forward there. Because that's a pretty big change for us this year. Yes, and we will uh, we oh. will do that. Uh, I as you see, I noted those yes, separately. Yeah. Those numbers down the bottom. We yes. will incorporate. I didn't want to yeah. artificially. Uh, skew the numbers I in relation to my projections because right. the projections did not include, at that time, did not include the preschools. Right, especially since um, if we're going to be discussing the assistant principal student support leader mm -hmm. position Model again this in the year, future. in mm -hmm. the future, I think that would be helpful. That's right. Thank you. Bill, should those numbers then be in the actual column, not in the projected column? That was uh, yes, question. excuse me, yes, thank you very okay. much. For I just was going to yep. ask, those, those may have been your projections, and then I was curious, I was going to ask Courtney, <laughs> How many actually came to be? Yeah. Um, now, uh, a point that I'd like to, the, to make also is our enrollment last year, our official enrollment count was 4,886 students. Now, keep in mind, now this is, you know, a, a significant drop of, you know, 100, 100 plus students. But if you recall, we have always had sort of the cohort students in the preschool also, which accounted for almost another 100 students. So that has to be accounted for in here. So the the enrollment decline is has to do a lot with the uh, the inability now mm -hmm. to have the uh, what are called role model or cohort students mm -hmm. in the preschool. Um, other okay. other questions. Okay, then um, next up would be Westford Athletics, and we have some guests here to talk to us. I want to thank Jim Antonelli and Athletic Director Jeff Bunyan for attending tonight. Um, <laughs> thank you uh, to the committee for allowing us to come in and present uh, Chris, I don't know, do you have the presentation up? The, the, the ECL one? Yes. Yeah. I can, yeah. I can pull up. The, the presentation that I'm going to share with you tonight uh, was a presentation that was put together uh, collaboratively uh, by the athletic directors in the Duke County League. And this is the same presentation that was delivered to the building principals, the superintendents, and their school committees. Uh, so I just, I thought it was important to share that information with you. Uh, some of the dates are a little bit, you know, maybe late August dates, but again, when we can move through those, but I just thought it was important to share that with you and then we can get into sp some specifics regarding, you know, specifics to Westford. But I will say that the athletic directors are completely aligned across the Dula County and we're all taking the same measures to keep our students safe and get them back out on the fields. So I'd like to start by reading the mission uh, that the DCL AD strongly believe that interscholastic athletics 
can play a vital role in re-engaging our students as we seek to get back to school in some sense of normalcy. A functioning athletic program will aid in the process of rebuilding the interpersonal connections that would fundamentally support the implementation of any of the instructional academic, model, academic models that are being proposed, whether remote or hybrid. In a quest to educate the whole student, it cannot be overstated enough the role that interscholastic athletics can play in fostering deep and positive social and emotional health outcomes in our collective communities. Through a modified competition structure, the DCL seeks to creatively reimagine what is possible within the constraints of all the new health and safety protocols that have been established in response to the ongoing pandemic. By limiting competition to divisional play, we aim to create a sustainable model for school-sponsored athletics through the duration of this pandemic. Next slide, please. The, uh, the Energy Environmental Affairs put together risk levels for sports. They've categorized them in three ways, lower risk, moderate risk, and higher risk. Uh, I'm not gonna read them all to you, but they're there, and what we're focusing on are pretty much the lower and moderate risk activities going forward right now in the fall season. The DESE guidance provided by the commissioner back on August 18th was really a focus on traditional fall sports. Basically, the, the governor based, uh, Governor Baker's color-coded virus rates uh, are with the red, the yellow, the green, or the white as far as the, the town designation. Westford is currently in the green. We were then, we are now. Uh, very clear that schools that are in a red district cannot participate in sports. Schools in the yellow, green, and white can participate if any school systems are remote in their learning re uh, reopening plans, they must receive the approval from their local school committees. Even though we're a hybrid, obviously it's important to collaboratively, collaboratively excuse me, discuss this with the whole group so everyone fully understands how we're going to, to, uh, to, move, this, to move this forward. We must follow all the EEA guidelines for individual sport participation in those set out by the MIAA, the Sports Medicine Committee, and the individual sports uh, committees. Higher risk sports, which were detailed on the previous slide, such as football, competitive chair, uh, unified basketball, those right now will have no competitions and they're moving them to a, a season later in the year, which I'll go over later. Uh, we will be, they will be allowed to practice, but only under very, very specific EEA guidelines. Traditional fall sports, moderate to low, like cross country, golf, girls volleyball, fall swim and dive, fall gymnastics, and field hockey, which isn't listed here, it was just a, an oversight, uh, would be able to be in this traditional fall season. The MIAA made several rule adjustments. They basically delayed the start of the traditional start date, which usually is late August to September 18th, which is coming up this Friday. Sports Medicine Community uh, Committee, excuse me, they met to, uh, to secure safe, safe guidelines that are all in line with the DESE and the EA. The MIAA recognized that there will not be any statewide state tournaments this year. Uh, they also talked about out of season coaching and that was approved, and we can get into that a little bit later for different dates for the school year. Uh, the dates that they put on it was for the MIA was September 18th through July 3rd. Uh, the DCL got together, and we, we, we agreed that the end of the season would be on June 25th uh, to make it more in line with the school calendar. Uh, districts unanimously responsible, we're ultimately responsible for our designations of our towns. Uh, excuse me, I skipped one. But as, in other words, as far as, far as following all the safety guidelines from the Sports Medicine Committee, the, DE, the DESE, and the EA, a lot of letters, mm -hmm. all the committees. Uh, as I said earlier, the districts are responsible if their designation changes 
So we're responsible for notifying the MIAA and uh, member schools. The MIA staff has already started to come up with some learning opportunities and communication strategies for students, parents, and coaches that we'll be pushing out to of all of our student athletes. And the MIA board of directors will meet to determine the winter season. Even though there are dates established, they'll be meeting on October 29th to talk about the winter season. Also, the, the, the process this year or the, the seasons is instead of the traditional three seasons, there'll be four seasons and I'll go through those dates. Uh, athletes, student athletes would be able to participate in all four seasons if they so choose. Again, looking at the timeline uh, for the MIA rule adjustments, uh, the process for building any modifications, because there are several modifications to each sport uh, and guidelines for fall sports. Back on August 25th, the sports committees and medicine committee, they delivered, uh, they met and they decided what would be safe to play under 11 three, level three requirements outlined by that EEA. On August 27th, the MIA task force got together with those uh, different groups in, to make recommendations. On the 28th, the MIA uh, COVID task force committee, they shared all their final recommendations with the board of directors for the MIA. And uh, that was accepted, all the changes or all the modifications that they made. On September 1st, any final considerations uh, for any changes or to adopt the sports modifications were made and then you see it says no date for each district to decide each district is ultimately responsible to decide how they will move forward with athletics and we're doing that here tonight uh, prior to play uh, appropriate planning must be made we've had countless meetings on uh, on how we would move forward as far as all of our protocols uh, I have the protocols listed on the next slide. I've also developed a letter that will go out to every person in the community and it will have a full list of all the different aspects of safety protocols that we will accept and abide by. And this is the same document that we'll be using across the entire Dual County League. So our goal is not only to keep our kids safe in our home sites, but to keep them safe when they are com uh, competing against member DCL schools. Return to athletics by school. Uh, as of 9-4, when I updated this slide last, uh, the, the DCL schools that I have listed there is the, the school itself, their reopening plan, whether it's hybrid or remote, and their vote regarding athletics following this, the MIA recommendations that we'll be following as part of this presentation. Happy to say that whether it's remote or hybrid, every school system has approved uh, the safe return to athletics that we're outlining. Uh, Newton South is actually voting tonight. Uh, so they were there in conjunction with Newton North. So that was a different uh, parameters that they had, but they're, they're voting as well tonight. But uh, every other school has voted yes under this plan. What we decided to do was come up with basically two divisions or two pods. Uh, Pod A, or Division One, Pod, Pod One, Acton, Boxborough, Cambridge, Ringe, and Latin, Concord, Carlisle, Lincoln, Sudbury, Newton, South, and Westford Academy. Uh, and Pod B, Bedford, Boston, Latin, Waltham, Wayland, and Weston. We would only be playing within our divisions or our pods. There is one crossover week that we would be playing someone in the other pod. However, and I'll get to that when we get to scheduling, uh, the schedule we'll be playing the same town the entire week all of our teams uh, and I'll get into that when I get into the scheduling portion but basically if we, we we're scheduled to start with Concord Carlisle we'd be playing them the entire week in all of our sports so if there was any contact tracing uh, that were needed we would we would have we would be in a much better position to to trace any contact uh, season one which is what we're talking about right now Tryouts and or practices would start on September 18th and run through November 20th. Uh, due to the Rosh Hashan uh, holiday this weekend, uh, we will be officially starting on 
September 21st, so it's different from what the slide says, but the actual MIAA dates are September 18th through the 20th. Uh, competitions would actually be, be, uh, begin on September 30th and they'd run through November 14th. Uh, the 14th to 20th would be reserved for some type of a pod league championship uh, in lieu of the no state championship that will be conducted by the MIAA. Uh, season one would consist of the following sports, boys and girls soccer, field hockey, golf, and girls and boys cross country. The traditional sports uh, that, that we usually see in the fall are, uh, as well as these, are football and competitive cheer and uh, indoor girls volleyball. Uh, those were moved to what's called the floating season, which is season number three. And uh, in a future slide, you'll see the actual dates uh, for those different seasons. Uh, the scheduling proposal, we made some change. That link isn't active right now, but basically, as I, as I said earlier, and I can, I can get this information to you, but we're gonna be playing our teams in our pods, and quite simply, it's uh, the, uh, we would play the same town for that entire week. And uh, the varsity would be playing interscholastic competition on Wednesdays and Saturdays. The sub-varsity teams would be seeing the interscholastic competition just on Saturdays. And midweek, whether it's Wednesday or Thursday, we haven't decided exactly, we will have scheduled inter-squad scrimmages between uh, just our teams, uh, they'll have an inner squad scrimmage game with an official uh, and it will be scheduled. But that cuts down on travel and uh, it, all, it also cuts down on the amount of times we'll, they'll be leaving campus. As far as those additional seasons that we talked about earlier, uh, season two would run from November 30th to February 21st. Those are the traditional winter sports. Again, the MIA is going to vote on that or, uh, on uh, October 29th, I believe it was. Uh, season three, which has had a lot of discussion around it, which is called the floating season. It's kind of, we've also referred to it as fall two, would be uh, football, fall cheer, girls volleyball. Uh, it says girls swim, but as you see next to it, just Acton Boxborough and Boston Latin have girls swim in the fall. And that's why those, just those teams would participate in fall too. Our girls swim team and our boys swim team, we compete in the winter, as you see, in season uh, two. So there'd be no change to that. That's a little bit sometimes confusing to some folks. But again, because this presentation was viewed by all, it was included accordingly. Uh, and then season four would go from April 26th to July 3rd, but as stated earlier, uh, the goal would be to wrap that up on June 25th, and that's our traditional fall sports. Uh, excuse me, traditional spring sports. Uh, before we get into protocols, is there any, is there any questions? I mean, I'll, we'll have time to go over any questions, but I didn't know if, if there was something on your mind. Wait, somebody saw yes, Chris? Yeah, I was wondering on some, some of the higher risk, risk sports, um, whether they be winter or they be fall ones that are pushed to the floating season, if conditions are such that we can't safely hold those in the winter, can they be pushed even further along or do we just run out of capacity, either coaching or facilities or players to really cram all of them in, you know, in the spring? It, it, it could be a challenge, uh, but there is flexibility within the seasons for leagues and teams to get together to adjust things accordingly. Okay. So. Uh, I don't have that answer for you, but sure. to, I mean, the answer is yes, there is an opportunity to do that. Typically, it's sometimes it's the same student athlete playing in both sports. So you'd have to have someone, maybe if we move football that traditionally plays lacrosse, there'd be a conflict there. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we could make it work, we will make it work. Our goal is to get our student athletes on the field competing for all those most social and emotional reasons that we, uh, you know, that we, that we know they really so that they need. Yes, Avery? So the high risk, I thought I heard you say that they won't compete 
but are you saying by moving football to February that they will compete and they remember that we live in New England and that in <laughs> February and March, I'm not sure you could pay me to be out on the field playing football. Well, the next, next meeting, we're trying to get a dome approved. <laughs> so, uh, just thought I'd ask. Yeah, no, uh, no, you, you did. I'm confused about that one. <laughs> you, you did hear me correctly. When I said they weren't going to compete, they aren't going to compete in the fall. And yes, the goal is to push those to that fall two season with fully understanding that it's February 22nd. So we would need to, I, again, uh, we would. Raise my eyebrows as well. <laughs> <laughs> and again, that's. MIA recommendations as to how okay. to do it. We want to try to find a way to include everyone. Uh, just like I was happy to hear Gloria mention earlier about clubs, and we want everyone to be able to, to sure. you know, to do whatever they can. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I mean, do, I do have concerns about that that fall two season and, and how that what that looks like in February and March here. Um, and I'm curious why, and maybe you don't know why they would include wrestling. To me. Wrestling is like high, high risk, and I'm not sure why you would even entertain it in here. And so that one jumped out at me as well. Avery, oh. sorry, no, maybe, maybe just in conditions improvement right. uh, to put it on there. So I think to you know, Chris's point, you know, are there other sports that may come out of high risk to moderate and so forth? Got it. I mean, yeah. right now it's not looking that way, but I think to be inclusive of all sports, to not have wrestling up there would just be to say it doesn't exist basically. Mm -hmm. And so, just if the conditions improve, uh, uh, continue to improve, hopefully, um, then maybe it's an option for students. Okay, and that would be made at the MIA or the DCL level. Well, maybe the first would be MIA. Yes, okay. Would dribble down to the schools. Yeah. Were there any sports that were just, as you said, removed from the list that are typically held? No, the only the only sport is uh, is our Westford Academy crew, which yep. it, it has not been removed. Uh, we partnered with Westford Community Rowing. Correct. We've always partner with to share boats, and they help us. They've agreed to run a fall program okay. through a, a smaller, modified, smaller boats. Uh, they're going to continue. They're going to keep our coaches on, and they're going to run like a clinic type thing because okay. we want to get those kids out onto the water. Uh, so, okay. again, I'm happy to happy to say that you know we had meetings, we put that together, and that's going to move forward. Okay, but that's the only sport of our regular list that was not included in this new schedule? Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, as far as protocols, I mean, there's, there's a lot on this slide, I, I, I grant you, but basically we have to follow all the governor's office, the EEA, the DESE, the Board of Health, MIA, Sports Medicine, and individual school uh, district guidelines for athletics. So everything that we do and propose will follow all of those guidelines. Uh, Spectators, we, we see them watching professional sports. They don't have fans in the buildings. Uh, our spectators would be limited to one family member per student athlete for each team. So right now it's 50, which is the outside, uh, you know, grouping. So uh, we have a uh, an idea that we've come up with or a protocol that uh, the DCL as well as the Middlesex League and the MBC is all doing we're going to create uh, league-wide lanyards and they're going to be specific to the town so as we'll say westford academy and we will give we'll be giving every student athlete a lanyard and each sport will have its own color and when they come to an event the lanyard needs to be visible they need to display it and my uh administrators at the gate similar to like taking tickets there will be no there will no there'll be no entrance fee but similar to coming in and paying a fee, they would come in, we would have a roster of both teams, and then we would check off who they're there for, who the lander kind of belongs to, which player. Uh, and that way there we can contact Trace if anything came up, and we can limit those crowds to 50, 25 home and 25 away. Uh, so the lanyard idea is, 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 I think, really, really solid. It's, uh, we're making sure that we are following that protocol because that's that's extremely important not just our student athletes on the field but our community members coming to watch uh, all athletes are required to wear masks and social distance while not actively competing like on the bench area or on the sidelines or on the buses 
each sport has modifications that calls for masks. Uh, so they're all individual when the masks need to be worn and for how long and at what point. But basically they have to wear their masks while they're competing. Uh, and they will be doing so. Uh, all coaches and team personnel is going to be required to wear a mask and socially distance at all times. I know the NFL just came out with a statement because they saw several coaches not wearing masks yesterday on the sidelines. Uh, I will have administrators at every game myself and I will have administrators at every game, whether it's varsity or sub-varsity, that's going to be monitoring that and making sure that those protocols are followed. Because at the end of the day, safety of all, our entire community, is, 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 is paramount. Uh, again, formal check-in process when they, get to the, when they get to the field, similar to maybe at a doctor's office or at a restaurant. Uh, I reviewed all this, by the way, with Jeff Stevens. And Jeff fully supports this plan. Uh, Jeff uh, didn't think it was necessary to take everyone's cell phone number, like we do sometimes when we're checking in at a restaurant. Uh, as long as we know who the athlete is that they've come to see, we can identify and communicate with the school. Uh, but we can do that. We can take down the cell phone number of the person coming. There's only 50, so it's not a, 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 uh, a big deal. He said he could always ratchet it back if not, you know, if it, was, if it was too much. But again, we are looking for any way we can to keep these athletes in the community safe. Uh, I also, while we're on that, I have a standing meeting with Jeff every week. We're gonna review the protocols, how they went for the week. Uh, did they work, did they not work? What are maybe some of the things we need to tweak? Uh, how's the, the town's designation? Whatever is going on. Uh, to just increase as much communication as we can to keep, to keep everyone safe. Uh, protocols continued, no post-game handshakes. Uh, we're gonna come up with some type of other symbolic recognition. Some leagues are having the, the athletes, you know, just clap for the other team. Uh, we're still trying to navigate our ways through what's the best way to acknowledge that sportsmanship. Uh, no one will be allowed inside the schools. Uh, they're gonna be outside, uh, except for the home team, but we're not going to be currently using any locker rooms inside the school at any time. So uh, the only time that would be uh, is for like inclement weather. If something were to happen, I would have designated areas for a home team and an away team uh, to go and communicate with the custodians accordingly. Uh, student athletes would bring their own water bottles. We wouldn't have the typical water fill up stations, uh, the trots that we have along around the stadium that would encourage uh, gatherings. Uh, student athletes should bring their own hand sanitizer. However, we will have hand sanitizing and wipes available at the entrance for our spectators and for all of our student athletes who will be required to wash their hands and sanitize their hands before they enter the field or as they're entering the field. We're going to have them enter through uh, designated areas so we can control that as best as possible. Uh, no public restrooms as far as facilities, but we will have porta potties available uh, and we also will be cleaning those uh, frequently we have the electrostatic cleaner we'll also have a station set up outside of the porta potty with wipes uh, you know and so forth for per, for anyone using them to to sanitize before they go in and then when they're done and those will be on those will be cleaned not only by the porta potty company but our uh, our custodial staff our evening staff. Uh, student athletes must wash their clothes, their uniforms after every session, uh, and they sh all equipment should be sanitized. Equipment being like soccer balls, they'll all, uh, girls varsity soccer will have their, their own balls and those will be sprayed with the electrostatic sprayer after every session. And athletes will also be encouraged to bring their own balls for, uh, for, uh, for their uh, practice sessions. Uh, big thing really is no loitering before and after games. That's something that's tough to control and that's something that I'll have to work with my coaches and be very diligent about that. Uh, I think as we, as we said earlier, uh, and, and Gloria mentioned, you know, the, the parties and the large gatherings, this, this is truly a community effort and a joint effort. We, 
we want our kids in school. We want, you know, we want this to work. We want this hybrid learning plan to work. We want athletics to work. We want to make sure we have clubs for everyone to enjoy. Uh, get back to that positive routine. And I think once we do that, if we take all these measures and put them in place, I think we'll be in the best shape we can and then be able to make changes as we go, but be very well aware of these processes that we put in place. Uh, lastly, this, this, this has come up a lot uh, since the uh, MIA announced this for coaching out of season recommendations. Uh, the theory is that our kids have lacked so much and they haven't been able to do anything. Uh, and can we have out of season coaching? Because typically you can only coach in the season that you're in. The MIA approved out of, coaching, uh, out of season coaching. But if you look at number one, which is probably the, the, the biggest bullet point on this is, it must be approved and agreed upon by the building principal. Uh, we need to make sure that if we do this, that we do this right. This opens up a huge can of worms where there's a, there's a lot of positives that can come out, come out of it, but the goal of it, and it's clearly articulated in the exp explanation, is to, uh, for the student athlete to connect for their social and emotional well-being and to see other faces, it's not to get a tactical advantage on another team, to have uh, you know, sessions to get your team ready. It's for everyone to join. It's optional and it's open to anyone. The biggest difference between this and what's in place currently is currently a coach can, can, uh, can put together uh, strength and conditioning for his team or her team, but they can't coach and they can't be active as far as skill-based. Uh, our DCL, we got together and recognized some of the issues that this might uh, because they didn't, uh, the DCL, excuse me, the MIA did not say, they didn't put a limit on it. They just said you can do it. Uh, the DCL got together and we approved a plan that would limit it to no more than two sessions per week and that the coaches could not coach their teams in, uh, in any tournaments or any leagues, put their teams in league and actually coach them. Because again, the spirit of the rule is to get the kids together, not to get a tactical advantage. Uh, re and at the end of the day, everything needs to be approved by Mr. And Principal Antonelli and myself uh, to do it in a safe manner. But there's a lot that would go into it, like signing up on family ID, making sure concussion protocols are in place, uh, making sure that someone has an active physical, all things that we require when students are in session. If we're going to approve this, we need to make sure that we are keeping our kids safe all the time and following all those safety protocols. That's all for this DCL <coughs> presentation. And again, this is one that, I, uh, that was delivered to everyone. And they use this to, 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 to form their opinions and to, uh, you know, and to make a decision. Any questions on the second half? Yes, Gloria. Um, yep, got a couple. Okay. Um, I, I really do appreciate all the coordination among among the DCL. I think that that's really reassuring to see because um, seeing that level of coordination among the schools really does kind of reinforce that everybody's going to be following the same protocols and practices and, and that enhances everybody's safety. Um, I also really appreciated seeing that the DCL kind of voluntarily split into those pods. Um, hybrid pod, these are like the buzzwords for 2020. Um, but but that does that does just make a, log a lot of logical sense um, to enhance safety. Um, I did wanna do a, a, a shout out, thank you for being mindful of the, the Jewish High Holy Days. Um, always, always appreciated um, by our Jewish community. So thank you for being mindful of that. Um, <coughs> questions? Um, one, one question I had certainly in terms of some of the, the sports we're talking about, um, you know, field hockey and soccer might be deemed a moderate risk, but I'm sure any field hockey or soccer player sitting here would, would attest to the physicality of, the, of those sports. And I know um, in the information you provided in our packet, you know, there's some modifications to the rules and, and mm -hmm. penalties. Um, I, I guess I'm just curious really from a a, a coaching perspective, mm -hmm. 
how do you take a, a student who may have been playing a sport for a really long time and engaging in a certain level of physical contact and and now teach them not to if that's really part of their game sure. um, so how, how do you how do you make that transition first of all great question and, and it's come up and I and I appreciate that uh, that's why we're holding to the to the time frame between the start of the season and the start of competition. Mm -hmm. There was, a, there was a, a push to start the, get the games going. Uh, we really wanted to hold to that nine day, 10, you know, nine, 10 day window to compete. Again, it's supposed to officially start on Friday, but we're starting on uh, Monday. Uh, and the coaches will be educated. They're gonna work with the officials and the, uh, the commissioner of officials I'm actually, the, I'm, I'm one of my roles for the DCL is I'm the liaison to the boys and girls soccer for the DCL. I have a uh, meeting tomorrow night on Zoom, which Chris, the Zoom master, was helping me out earlier. Uh, so usually I use Google Meet, but uh, so I have a meeting tomorrow night with the soccer community, all the coaches, and the commissioner of officials is going to be on there. He's going to talk to them about the new rules, go over those with them. Then there's gonna be some time to collaborate between the coaches, and we're just gonna to continue to reinforce the new rules. Uh, again, it's tough to change up, to answer your question, uh, but I think the kids, the kids that, the kids wanna get out there, and they're, they're gonna to, they're gonna to understand, and it's gonna be a collaborative effort. So if they do something that's outside the rules, the referees are going to assess it accordingly. And uh, the goal is, again, the safety. So they're just going to have to try to adapt, just like we're adapting with our reopening a school plan or anything else. We're going to have to adapt. And, and I think the key is monitoring it and then having communication. Uh, typically, we have a beginning of the season meeting, and that's it. We're going to schedule meetings periodically through the season to get the coaches all together because it really is, it starts with the coach and it starts with the, uh, the coordination between the student athlete, the coach and the officials so they can all work collaboratively together. The, the referees are really gonna take an active role in trying to help and guide the athletes through these times. So There is a level of physicality, no doubt, from, uh, in both sports. And, and you, can't, you can't pull that away, uh, but you certainly can work with some conditions, provide some conditions and provide some coaching uh, to support this. Uh, but you, you can't pull away the physicality of, of both of those sports. It's just people are going to bump into each other. People are going to be aggressive out there. It's the nature of sport, right? So um, we just have to try and uh, monitor it and do the best we can, allowing student athletes to get out there to participate. Uh, but to Jeff's point, a lot of the things are, you know, when the kids come off and they're not actively participating, they're putting their masks back on, they have sanitizer you know, and those kinds of things were to try and minimize any of those uh, contagions being shared. So I know we have, we've got a lot of multi-sport athletes at Western Academy. So when you, you do touch on, and I know you're not sure how you, how you fa I think feel about this with the out of season coaching, but if out of season coaching was allowed, w wouldn't it kind of put students who are multi-sport athletes in the position of maybe playing two sports at once and would that kind of you know enhance kind of potential you know cross-contamination between those teams and things like that uh to answer your question that's one of the factors that we're considering jim and i have mr antonelli and i have talked about that uh it, it's it's purely it's it's 100 percent optional any of the uh uh, sessions that any student athlete would go to and the last thing we want is for a student athlete to be in the fall season a soccer player that uh, that plays a different sport and then compete five to six days on the soccer field and then that one day they have off feel obligated to go to that uh, you know that basketball optional practice uh, so it is something that I will say very very lucky to have great coaches and our coach is very reasonable and we have really open dialogue all the time. Uh, so I would work with all the coaches. And uh, again, the, the, the conversations, I've had some conversations, I haven't rolled out the whole plan to them yet. So there's been some different information that's out there. 
but uh, we'll all work together and do the best we can uh, with keeping all those factors in place. If, if this were to be approved, the whole of our piece that we're bringing here tonight, that would be one thing that would be on the microscope for me. I'm, I'm uh, really conscientious about uh, coaching out of season, and so that would be something that, that Jeff and I would take a look at and really be clear with coaches. A perfect example of a student athlete you know, participating in you know, soccer you know, for four or five days, six days, and then all of a sudden Sunday afternoon have to go out and play hoop you know, because the coach wants them there. And so it would be, it would be really specific, and that would... Uh, uh, you know, we'd just be watching that very closely. Um, the the last question I have, and then I'll open it up for others. Um, but I, I hate to ask this one, but you know, I gotta ask it. Um, one of the 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 schools you put up there was Lincoln Sudbury. Yep. Um, Lincoln Sudbury was in the news this weekend. They're opening remote because they just had a large party. Um, unfortunately, you know. All of us, I know you've heard these reports, school committee has heard these reports of a lot of gatherings over the summer. Some of them have been sports teams who have been having banquets, understand the urge to, to say goodbye to seniors or to have gatherings over the summer. We have heard reports of captain's practices, scrimmages with other towns, um, uh, you know, tournaments of sorts um, that have kind of been happening under the radar all summer. Um, and, and I think it's an understandable question from, from, from parents, from the community, and that we have to ask um, how, given that protocols have been lax over the summer, um, how, how does the community and the, the committee have confidence that, that that'll be different in the fall? Okay, well, get, first of all, with, 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 with regard to the Lincoln-Sudbury question, we built in a bye week for every single team. And already that was adjusted, so Lincoln Sudbury has the first week on a bye. So no one would even see them for three weeks. Uh, and if something happened, we have other buys that we could move around the games. So that's, we've tried to take that into consideration instead of packing it all in. Uh, and with regard to the second part of your question, the supervision, the coach supervision, and, and I, and, and the protocols that are in place, uh, the formal protocols that, will, with, that are in place that it were very, very difficult uh, over the summer that we just, you know, struggled with, quite honestly, because it, it had just hit and there was a lot of, there was a lot going on. Uh, but following these guidelines from the state and following from the MIAA uh, and our guidelines that we put together with the proper supervision, we're hoping to, uh, you know, take care of any of those issues that, that popped up in the summer. I abs absolutely appreciate the answer. You, you understand why I had to have sure. to Sure. No, and I, I <laughs> listen, I appreciate you asking it because it's, uh, we were very aware, uh, well aware of everything that's gone on when we were developing these plants. Uh, like I said, the, the information packet that's going to be going out to these, uh, that I'm going to be reviewing with the coaches on Thursday and pushing out to the student athletes on Thursday evening. Uh, and then the, the in-person meetings on the first day about what we're going to be doing and how we're going to be doing this before they even get on the field is uh, we're taking it very serious. We need to make sure that this is done the right way in order for it to succeed. Uh, we want it to be sustainable. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Yeah, please. So I appreciate that answer. I know we've talked a couple times about these captain's practices. Um, we also had the... Um, banquets at the end of the season, I know Gloria just mentioned, where coaches um, and, and WA staff are present, not adhering to social distancing and mask wearing. Um, in looking through the soccer one, it's very clear that after, if you do this too many times, you're going to get a yellow card. What are your plans for finding out that a bunch of the kids are, are practicing on their own, unmasked, unsupervised? or if coaches are not adhering to the rules or participating in activities that don't follow the guidelines? Well, I will say that all my coaches sign a code of conduct and that they will follow every rule. These rules are gonna be in place with them. Uh, I will be taking it very serious. I know Principal Antonelli will be as well. I will be at every session for practices and games. Uh, I will also have administrators if I'm not at that specific site that will be 
responsible for making sure that that is. And I'll have constant check-ins with my coaches uh, to make sure that that is followed. Because as you said, and as I said at the beginning of this presentation, the safety really is something we need to follow through with. And if in order for this plan to be sustainable, it needs to be followed through on. How are kids getting back to school to practices? That was the other big, I don't want kids to be, got, they get home and then all of a sudden, now it's, it's an inconvenience. I mean, I know we, we don't, we're not providing buses back to the schools at the end of the day. Our practices, I, so anyway, yeah. How, what time and how are we logistically getting kids around? Yeah, practices will be after the, after the remote school day. So after, the, probably around 2.30, 3 o'clock uh, at the academy, they would get their own way back there. Okay. Uh, no different than in the past. If they were practicing at maybe 4 o'clock, they would go home on the bus and then they would get their own way to practice. Uh, but if there's, if, if, if there's a, a situation that we need to look at for inclusion, I want to make sure that we do it. Again, I want all student athletes competing. Uh, I've talked to Ingrid maybe about a, possibly a, re, a reverse late bus. Uh, I don't know if that's something that's still on the table, but yeah, I think we, if, if, if we need to do something, I want everyone included. No, no one, there shouldn't be anyone that's excluded from this program. We spoke with Renee D last week and she was very enthusiastic about hearing that we were hoping and proposing this athletic uh, program to, to the school community this week. So she's open to some kind of transportation and we're going to figure this out. Okay. But everything's, you know, everything's being drawn up in the sand right now to the best of our ability. It's sandlot football, and sandlot baseball, and sandlot soccer. And, it's just difficult. So as Jeff said, we're going to tackle some of these things as we as we go we come through them. But you know, we've had the conversations with Ingrid about what does the funding look like and can we do some of these things to be creative. Same thing we're doing with hybrid, remote, oh, yeah. and, and everything that's happening in the classroom right now. Um, it's just uh, day by day trying to get these rituals and routines back in action. Yes, Valerie. Just to jump on the bus question. Um, so what does it look like to travel to other towns? Um, like how many, I, I mean, how many, how big is a team? How many buses do you normally have? Now does this double that? Yes, uh, it will, it will double it. Uh, typically we put two teams on a bus traveling together, varsity to JV. Uh, that's the reason why the Wednesday contest would just be varsity. Uh, and the buses can, can handle 24 to 25 people on the bus. We'd also uh, allow private auto transportation if parents want to drive their students to games, we would get a list of that prior to so we could find out what we need for buses. And there's a documentation process for that so that you know who's on the bus and who's driving? Uh, yes, okay. yeah. It would all be done through the coach and a roster, a formal check-in, just like if somebody wanted an excuse that to, to get a ride home or something, as long as yeah. that's done ahead of time, right, right. we would approve that. And is the Wednesday and Saturday, is that... Is that a normal amount of games or competitions, it's, or is that less or more? It's it, it's it's it is less, but the season's a little bit less, so it is compressed. Okay. Uh, so uh, again, it would be Wednesdays and Saturdays throughout from now right through to November fourteenth, or when it starts. Excuse me. And Ingrid, how does that work for a bus rate? Is that like a per day bus or a per? So for athletics, um, those transportation um, costs get paid through the, um, by the fees actually, the athlete, through the athletic revolving account. So um, so that's separate from, you know, kind of our budgeted sure. transportation costs. I'm just wondering, since it was less games, is it, will it cost us less? It would, it would be or less for a fit. More buses or something. Well, Sorry, I'm just I'm just, No, 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 I'm just yeah. trying to figure that out. Right, so, I mean, and, and you know, we're gonna talk about the user fee as well and, yeah. um, um, that's one of the, you know, our recommendation is for you to consider um, keeping the fee at the previous level rather than increasing it in one of those um, savings that um, we can offset the loss of that increase of fee would be decreased uh, transportation costs. Okay. And, and one just for a quick, quick question, just so I'm understanding from a big picture, this is one vote for the whole year, or are we voting each season? What, what, I, what I would ask is to recommend... I don't want to jump ahead, sorry. No, it's uh, to, 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 to approve 
the uh, the the MIAA recommendation for high school athletics for Westford Academy, but then every season it would be looked at by the MIAA to see what we can do safely under the same guidelines. So, okay. uh, again, I don't know if that answers your question. It would be for the entire recommendation as you see in this presentation, all the different seasons. Okay. However, before every season, the MIA will look at it and say, all right, what can we do? What can we do with the guide under the guidelines of all these different groups to make sure that they can be done safely? So I would just add that if, if with that, then maybe we have some sort of like sure. coming back I would, I would, I would think we would. Okay. Yes. Um, other, other questions from the committee? Yes. Yeah, so, someone just raised a good point about this. So the the spectator plan, Jeff, right, is one parent per uh, student. Yep. Okay. So um, let's say it's a sport that's not as highly attended. Are you? Would we allow for? You know, one one student to bring in a second parent or something. If that, if we were under the 50 mark. Yes. Again, you know, we would give a lanyard to each student athlete, so we okay. know how many lanyards would be would be handed out. So if there was 25, let's just say, on any team, whether it's whether it's heavily attended or not. Yeah. And someone knows that their parent isn't going to come, they can give their lanyard to someone else and then okay. just check it off. But once we get to that limit that's the limit but we'll know so there won't be lanyards floating around when if so for someone to show up and say hey I have one legitimate why can't I get in you're at your number so yes there could be more than one for if two family members were going to come if somebody wasn't going to use it uh, but there would only be a certain amount of lanyards that are given out for those events and the idea behind that would be we'd know exactly who's there for contact tracing right okay yes okay. all right as opposed to just hey use your lanyard and go at it you yes. know okay got it and the lanyards of Sean again are yeah. color coded by sport so let's say okay. you know orange would be the color for field hockey you know so we'd know that we gave out a certain number so if two parents came in with you know two orange because one of the other parents decided not to attend the game that day then we'd have a limited number of, of student uh, spectators that would be there Okay, yeah. great. Is the 50 just spectators or does that include uh, participants on the field? Just spectators. Just spectators, okay. So there, there was a, a community question that's kind of tangential to sports, uh, but related. Um, how, how does um, marching band potentially figure in? Um, and, and I guess I'll broaden that to, to maybe also ask, I mean, obviously we've got lots of students who want to be active in this in the school but aren't athletes so what what are kind of the plans for other extracurricular activities that aren't athletics yeah so to our conversation uh, with co-curriculars um, I definitely want to move forward with as many as possible and the plan is to have teachers uh, or advisors submit a plan back to me for me to review that and uh, to come up with some dates um, you know how they can do this uh, hi in a hybrid model. How they can do this in a remote if we go to remote learning model and so forth, and then review all those and to try and have as many co-curriculars uh, as possible. But we'll, you know, that's we've talked about a, an October deadline to try and figure that out. Again, I'd love to have marching band. Uh, they do a great job. Michael Sue does a terrific job, and um, I've been very proud of that organization over the last several years. So um, we'll have a conversation. He's part of the co-curricular uh, co uh, advisors. And we'll see where that's going to take place. You know, again, that is an. Uh, usually, they do. Um, you know, football games. You know, halftime events and Thanksgiving and so forth. And where that's in February now, we don't know how that would uh, play out. So, <laughs> certainly a conversation I'm going to have with Michael. And maybe it is just something where um, we put the, uh, the band together, and they present on a Friday night with a certain number of parents that can be there again. And maybe we could double that. You know, for. Uh, for parents on an evening like that. We can see 1,200 in the stands and maybe they perform in the fall. Uh, I'm, I'm open to anything. It uh, doesn't need to be tied to a specific sport. It could just be an event where they want to show off Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club plan they did two years ago. It was, it was terrific, you know, so go for it. You know, we can put the lights on and they and they run through their whole show. Love it. You brought up another point that made me ask. Um, Hybrid or remote? Now, if we're in hybrid right now, the sports are going on. If we go to full remote 
because of a surge in cases in town, I assume that sports would cease. But maybe I'm assuming well, incorrectly. It's a, it's a great question, and it's a question that we should talk about because there are sports that you've seen here, or schools that you've seen here, that are full remote right out of the gate, that have voted that, right. they're, that they're gonna have sports at this time. If we have an increased surge, we have to have that discussion and we have to have a protocol in place as to how we want to move forward. Because we yeah. have in, in the MOU with the, the union, we have a COVID data driven full remote and we have a staffing other reason for full remote. And I'm not sure I'm okay with sports if we're having more COVID and we've closed the schools due to that. I don't want the kids coming back and playing if we said we can't have them in the schools. And I mean, I understand if it's a, an administrative or a staffing issue, I don't want to penalize the kids and not let them be able to come back to school for sports. But I have trouble getting past, if they're not allowed in the building for school, why are we letting them come back to the, the building for sports? May I say, I believe the commissioner's guidance on that is that if a school is uh, remote, it, it, it does require the, school committee approval. And right. so you would have, I think, that, uh, that ability to say no, no more sports. Okay. It seems like we could also add it into the metrics advisory committee, right? That's mm -hmm. reviewing the data so that if, mm -hmm. if we're, if that committee is talking about schools, you know, question number two is, does it affect athletics or co-curriculars? So. Mm -hmm. I don't see us giving any pushback, uh, Avery, if we start to see an increase. Uh, this is all about safety, you know, and, right. and letting kids participate in a safe environment. If we start seeing an uptick, uh, we're going to have to come back to the table and say this isn't going to happen. I also assume if we have an uptick in town, not just in the school, that's going to change our color coding on the governor's mm -hmm. sheet. And if we leave green and go to, I don't even know if there's yellow and red, yeah. mm -hmm. then it's green yellow then red okay and there's white which is even less than green yes so as long as you're white or green you're okay so i guess his his kind of coding would also catch his code rise in cases yes his his coding states that if it goes to red they can't compete there's no questions asked okay so it would be captured under that if there was a surge that went okay. to the red not the school the town Correct. If the town designation goes to it. Okay. I'm just trying to think it out yep. based mm -hmm. on what our MOU is says. Yep. Absolutely. Well, that also raises like our like our trust in other town decisions and other towns' decisions, um, right? Like if they're yellow, are we watching their numbers as yes. well as our numbers? Absolutely. Okay. So if we start out Valley with Concord Carlisle, you yeah. know, and all of a sudden within the next week we see that. There was a, another event that happened in Concord and Carlisle. We're not going to be participating with Concord and Carlisle okay. out of the gate if that was the first group that we were supposed to play. And are all the sports seeing the same town the same week? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. The only uh, the change to the to the Wednesday size would be maybe golf, depending on course availability. Okay. But we still be playing the same town. Okay. Twice a week. And I see you paused middle school athletics or potentially paused? I, I had a meeting with the with the principals and just yep. due to the supervision at the schools, getting the kids back and so forth, uh, and the middle school league was canceled. Uh, that went into that, and, and, I, and I'd like to re-evaluate and rediscuss that, you know, for the next season. For the next season, okay. Because... In your talks, I've heard varsity, are we, are we also, what are we doing with freshman sports? Is That's, that... Kind of going, cut, you know. No, nope, that's that that's in the plan. That's it's, it in would the be referred to as sub varsity. Sub varsity. Okay. Which is sorry, my, my mask <laughs> might have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that's in the plan as well. Okay. So it's all sports at WA. Okay. Well, the sub varsity includes the the junior varsity and the freshman teams yes. for for sports that have all all of those options. Yes. I know not all do. And but, are there any okay. intramural sports that are not kind of this level that are just sort of low like? Even like a club sport? No. Okay. No. Other uh, other questions? Did we have? Do we have a live commenter? So we yeah, get to test that time. technology. Cool. Yep. 
Um, Chris, Chris is setting you up, but when uh, live commenter, when you come live, please give us your name, address, and your comment, uh, just like you would if you were here live. Hello. And who you're with. Introduce your yeah. friend. <laughs> I don't know if I need to introduce myself, but it's Janelle Chow. Um, so I don't really have a question. I just have a comment. So as far as um, sports and the exposure, um, having two athletes that go to WA, um, having sports at school is a more controlled environment than these kids sitting at home with no rules. I mean, not no rules, but um, they're athletes that like to go out, like to do things, and if they're doing it with their teammates in school with rules in place, they will follow them 100% versus not following them. All the kids really want to go back. But the other piece is, is that for, like all kids, when you have your why taken away, it's very hard to focus in school and very, you know, a lot of athletes keep their grades up so they can do sports. Mm -hmm. um, so overall, it's more of a motivator and an outlet than anything, um, and it's their way of life. So that's really all I want to say. I just wanted to have a proponent for sports going forward. <laughs> Thank you, Janelle, for the feedback, and I'm so glad you were our first guinea pig. Um, welcome. It's good to see you. And yeah, the back of the house isn't that clean. Sorry. Or whatever. All good. The dog's here. Oh. 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 Yes. Yes. I love it. Can we make that a requirement? Uh, for uh, if sponsors? anybody needs any parent volunteers on the field to help make sure that everybody is following court call, I'm happy to arrange parents to show up. Awesome. Awesome. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Janelle. Thank you. Good thank to you. see you. Welcome. Bye, guys. And thanks for everything that you've been doing. I can't even imagine the work. And i got to say, I'm a little thankful I'm not part of it. <laughs> 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 I'm, 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 I'm shutting her off. I'm shutting her off. <laughs> thank you, Janelle. <laughs> Bye, Janelle. Bye, Janelle. Only time. So I, know, it is I, I think she raises a really good point, you know? Yeah. I was just thinking, I mean, it's kind of like smoking in public or something, right? Like, we're all going to be policing each other through this. So maybe uh, making it clear as to what we're requiring our parent spectators so they can police each other, right? Because no one wants to be, it's, it's enough on the referees and the coaches to have to be providing that too. So, and of course, this is going to be some trial and error, right? And as we go along, things might change. We might realize that certain things aren't working. Well, Sean, what's going to happen is yeah. people are going to think, well, I'm outside, but we'll have to do certain things, right? To your point. Yeah. So we're going to have to remind them. When you, when you come into the field of, of practice or play, you're going to have to have a mask on. That's just right. how we're doing things. That's our standard operating procedure. So right. to Janelle's point, we'll, we'll take her up on that if there's mm -hmm. some parents that want to help work with us. Yeah, know? absolutely. Uh, but sometimes people will forget. I mean, uh, I need to you hear about these issues? I cannot see them. Mark and Basket and other places throughout mm -hmm. the community where they just walk in and you see arguments taking place. We don't want to have that happen. So we'll send out the parameters and, and make sure things are spelled out mm -hmm. to the best of our ability. Awesome. And we think we can do all that in a week. Well, Jeff, i got to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I know how things have been flowing around here, and it's kind of... He's been working tremendously with his group of uh, sure. BCL yeah. athletic directors, and a lot of the, the uh, literature is already put out there, so we would put additional signs uh, in the entrance to the, the yeah, fields. Um, sign, yeah, sign, signage is being created on the uh, sandwich boards, so that's the first thing people will see mm -hmm. as far as the masks, uh, the six feet, and the hand sanitizing. Uh, two things uh, that I wanted to make sure I mentioned, and, and it kind of got brought up, because these athletes are part of a team, th these coaches, again, th they are absolutely terrific in the, the influence they have over their student athletes and the rules that they put in place for their teams the night before a game. Uh, th there's the chemical health violations that, that, that <laughs> the student athlete doesn't want to go down that road because there's extra... Uh, you know accountability for them the coaches do a great job making sure the teams are accountable and that's something that's going to be very very important is that is is the impression that that coach has on on his teammates to make sure that they're not having large gatherings to reinforce the rules that are all you know going on that's going to be part of the coaches discussion I need to make sure that that's going to happen, and I will. And I'm very confident my coaches will take my lead on that. 
One more clarification. They do wear their masks during competition or they don't wear their masks during competition? They, no, they, they do wear their masks depending on the modifications. Soccer okay. has to wear them. If there's within a 10 foot time, they're allowed to take it off and just take a breath and put it back on. But they I need see. to keep that on during the competition. Just okay. that was one specific. Okay. Uh, something else that just as far as the spectators that got brought up, uh, I've been working with. Uh, with Westford Cat, uh, to with Nick and to Steve about live streaming the events. Mm -hmm. uh, we started so that really last good. year. Yeah. It was Prince of Principal Antonelli had a, had a vision to try to do more of that. Yeah. I grabbed onto it and we did a few basketball games last year. We had some students that loved to film and we had kids commentate. Mm -hmm. it, it worked out pretty well. Uh, we put them up on the skyjack. We rose the skyjack up so they were up over the court. <coughs> It really, it, it was, it worked out very, very well. We're going to continue that in uh, between Nick and Steve, we, because they've they've been able to telecast for school committee, yep. so they can run the cables that they need from the building. They are very talented. I look at this, <laughs> so uh, that's something that we want to do. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, that would be a goal of mine to get those on there and not just the varsity events. I'm really paying attention to all the events. I won't be able to get everyone on, but I will try to make sure that I, you know, uh, hit as many sports and as many teams as I can. That's important to them. It doesn't matter if you're a freshman athlete or a varsity athlete. Their event is important to them, and that's what's really important. Okay, but tell me that the swimmers do not have to wear masks. <laughs> that's a that's a winter. I haven't seen those modifications yet. All right, yet. very good. Well, they could put the right over and that's true. You know, that's true. I don't know. Who no, knows? Can't get wet. That's but right. uh, <laughs> so that's that's kind of the situation. Uh, we also I know Ingrid talked about the user fees. I don't know if that would be that's probably a separate vote. But I know that this. But group it is here. What's the rationale in reducing? I mean, I guess rationale. Uh, quite frankly is it is a compressed season yep. there will be a few less officials although for those and uh, in, in, in we're going to we're going to we're going to promote private automobiles people taking their their student athletes to the games okay uh, so I don't based on our the calculations I have with the amount of buses and kids we can support staying where we were okay. we were at 275 we voted to go up to 325 yep. Uh, when Ingrid and I have talked about it, we feel that staying at the 275 that was in place last year, uh, we'll be able to make that work. Yeah, okay, we, so we do have some balance in the revolving fund that <laughs> we, you know, I mean, we hope that there are enough savings, but there is a stopgap there. Um, just to remind everyone, because I know the 21 budget development <laughs> cycle seems so True. far ago, uh, long ago. With, you know, when you think about what we've done in between. Um, so we had budgeted just specifically for the athletic fees, 85,000 as a budget offset. So that's kind of the, the differential that we would be um, needing to make up as a point of reference. So between the cost savings that um, Jeff feels that he would be able to realize and um, some of the revolving funds. Um, and just, you know, I think everyone um, realizes how much our students are giving up that you know if this is something this Ooh. year maybe um, you would entertain considering sorry more questions does that mean we're going to collect four seasons of, of sports fees and is that a I mean I guess that's a good or I don't know and do we have enough if say come the winter break we get shut down for the the flu and and all of this and we're closed and we miss a season or part of a season are we cutting ourselves off to being able to cover the seasons that we are running does that make sense no you're not going to make money off this correct one season's not necessarily going to be the other it should okay um, it should pay more itself um, depending on you know participation to um, you know I, it, it's obviously up to you. Yep. I think it's it's just something we'd like you to consider. I okay. think we could do it. Um, we could revisit it next season. Obviously, you want to be fair and equitable among mm -hmm. all seasons. But um, I feel like it's it's an amount that is doable. Okay. Uh, financially. 
So we, it sounds like procedurally we really need to take two votes here. We need to take one regarding the fees, but the first vote, of course, would be um, approving sports. Um, just to clarify the ask of, of, of what, what our motion really needs to be, so our, would we be approving Westward Academy's participation in athletics during the 2021 school year in accordance with the modifications set forth by the MIAA and supported by the DCL? Very well said. That's, that's, that's what <laughs> that we're looking that for. Perfect. That, okay. <laughs> that was perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, so moved. Second. Right. And we have a second. Um, any discussion before we vote? Just a quick little point as you were talking about the lanyards. I, I think I would like to see the cell phones just because you were saying, like, if somebody's not going, then they're mm -hmm. giving it to somebody. So maybe my lanyard isn't my mom. It's somebody else. You know, mm -hmm. so I just think that extra layer would be good if we're if we're kind of given some flexibility there. We're going to start with that. Okay. And then I, we, Jeff and I, we talked about it. But I, I feel I like that when I go into a restaurant or a doctor's office, I know that they've got my info yeah. just in mm -hmm. case. So right, right. Good point, Valerie. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, uh, I'll add the proviso on to my to my motion. Um, I think it would be great for us and for the community if you could pop back at, at the start of every season and kind of let us know what are the what are the what are the recommendations from the MIAA? Is the DCL doing anything different? What's the plan for the season? Um, just to do that check-ins, and I think we should continue to have some conversations mm -hmm. about about metrics, and you know to make sure. I, I know. We've got a clear. If it's red, that's a no. If it's green, that's good. We got this squishy middle with the yellow. And I mean, I think it's mm -hmm. worth having some continued conversations about. I know it sounds like you're already extremely sensitive to that, but uh, I think we should just have some continued conversations around those metrics and, and do that check in at the start of each season would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. No mm -hmm. Great. Barring any other questions, call for the vote. And I don't have to roll call everybody because <laughs> I can actually yeah, see you. Wait, I don't so, even know how to vote now. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, actually can just, you actually can just raise your hand. All in favor. That's great. Thank you very much. There you go. A great Thank presentation. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you need a Thank second you. vote? Yeah. Thank yeah. you for all those details. Mm -hmm. And the second yes. vote, and what would be your recommendation, Ingrid? Uh, just to keep the athletic fees at um, two seventy five for the year for um, sport. Okay, so two it, so two seventy five per so sport. Per, per sport, no cap. I'm reading the little. Okay. 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 So the motion on the floor I is to um, make an adjustment to have our our athletic fees be two hundred seventy five dollars um, for for each. sport sport per season for the school year 2020 for, mm -hmm. for the for the That's entire school year yep. yep for the entire for the entire school year mm -hmm. so um do i have a second second and any questions or discussion sorry yep. go ahead so just when you brought it up you talked about less uh, compressed season less officials and less buses so you think that those three things will carry over through all of these the whole year I mean it seems like we're talking about soccer field hockey golf and cross country but you think those will affect all of the whole I mean, year okay. every season is somewhat compressed mm -hmm. just yeah. to even get the four and okay. even though it extends longer into June okay thanks any other questions <laughs> <laughs> okay all all in favor it, it was a long wait and a long discussion, but well worth it. <laughs> Thank you. Great Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. For Thank you. Board. If I could also just raise, um, because we've talked a lot of, about equity, if there are families that are having trouble paying for this, even though it is reduced back to what it was last year, we know the economy is not great right now. Who should they contact if they ha are having trouble coming up with those funds if they can't afford that? They should contact our athletic director, Mr. Bunyan, mm -hmm. please. Yeah. Okay. We've always Thank worked with much. families. There's Thank been you. so many generous people that have come forward this community year after year, Alicia, that have said, I don't want to be known, but I'm willing to give $1,000, $500 to support student athletes, send kids on the Disney trip, or whatever. So uh, we have some resources, and sometimes just an all call or just, uh, or Jeff can, you know, communicate with those parents and we can figure it out. Excellent. Thank you. 
Jeff, is the um, middle school sports going to be discussed again, or is that a, a done deal? I would. Um, are they going to be offered any like intramural, like for, you know, cross t cross uh, Stony versus Blanchard games or anything? I would like to look at it in the future seasons, not for the fall okay. right now, because it, based on my conversation with the building principals, okay. they just thought it would be too much right now. Because I would hate. I mean, there there isn't as much need as the high school kids, mm -hmm. and so I hate to cut them off. I know it was valuable and quite the rivalry. Yeah, those games were. <laughs> <laughs> Quite interesting. I would love. I, I will. I will revisit it with okay. them to see what we could do, if anything. I would love to get as many kids active as possible. Right. Regardless of the level, I know that there's a lot of programs at Millworks that 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 can offset some of you know some of their not being able to do something with the school. But even the Westford but Youth Soccer had to adjust, and they're doing foosball, I believe, not soccer. So keep them more spread out. Mm -hmm. So I, I just worry about taking it all away from them. I, I do too, and I want to. I'll revisit it every single season because I'd like to. I would like to make it work for everyone. Okay, but we're not going to revisit middle school fall sports at this point. At this point, that wasn't the plan. Okay, because so that would be soccer. Do they have field hockey? Soccer, yeah. field hockey, cross, cross country. country. Okay, so we're not okay. All right. Because cross country seems like an easy one that you clearly aren't. If you're good, you're not near anybody else. <laughs> well, maybe um, you know. Let's get into the school year and we'll, we'll yeah. let the building. I just don't want them have to those discussions. Fall off completely either. But yeah, I mean, we, we'd of course be concerned about the you know the physical and, and emotional well-being of those middle school students as well so um, whatever whatever we can do at the middle school level to also get those kids active and, and back in extracurricular if parents are wanting to they, they should they contact you about middle school or yep. the principals about middle school no they sports? should contact me me okay yeah. so contact yeah. you and even about will, middle I school I will follow up with the principals I'll okay. also follow up my uh, middle school liaisons okay just want to make sure we have the right channels yes Perfect. Okay. Great thank, thank you for joining thank us. You. I know it was a late night. Thank Thanks for thank you. Appreciate hanging it. in there. <laughs> Good luck tomorrow. Are you going there? <laughs> are we? I can move this over. Can you get the bike? Okay. Okay. Table anything? I, yeah. I, I mean, I just, I hate to ask because uh, it's time I'm off. actually wondering. Yeah, I, I know you're coming to the table, yeah. Ingrid, but I, I am wondering. After yeah. 10 o'clock, I don't know how well, I mean, your brain may still do well with numbers, but I'm not sure how well my brain is going to do well, with honestly, numbers. Honestly, that's why I suggested just um, doing a super yeah. fast overview. You did receive my reports. Obviously, mm -hmm. I'm here to answer any questions. I can do it tonight. I'm happy to do it at your next meeting. Um, however you want so there no off, no skin off my nose <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, we wouldn't know if there was yeah. Yeah. i just hate i just hate to get I dive would. into a big financial discussion yeah no. I, I, right don't know that, I don't know that my brain would be up for it and honestly, I, I really comfortable with that? Think that we really um, yes. still have to focus on on school reopening and 21 um and you know doing an analysis of 20 is really more useful once we head into the budget season. So if you know putting it off a week or two is not gonna um, is that gonna screw everything up? But uh, I just I I oh. I think that's fine if you think yeah. that I, I, that's fine. It's um, it's obviously I'm prepared will, to do whatever you want. So Nina will keep us straight, and we will be sure to carve out time in the next mm -hmm. agenda so we don't like do said, that no again. <laughs> and the finance <laughs> group hopefully will have met before yeah. that. That's a good and point. And I think it could give a little bit. That could help. Yeah, you know, we could go over it in depth. In that group. I mean, we start to use that group effectively. Yeah. Uh, I, okay. I like it. I like it. Good plan. Um, we do need to take uh, two votes tonight. These are both on agreements that um, our negotiation team reached with. Oh, oh. sorry. <laughs> that, no, they're that, after that. After. Oh, okay. Yep. Don't worry. We won't forget. No, 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 no. no. Um, don't worry. We won't forget your warrants. We're good. I, I, know, I know I'm new to the chair, but no, no, they won't let me screw that up. Um, so uh, these these are two agreements 
that our negotiation team um, has uh, reached with the um, WEA and those um, discussions have been very helpful in, in clarifying um, working conditions and our contractual obligations between the school district and the, our teachers and, and other, other professional staff um, about how we all gonna operate in this, this new environment. Um, one, the first um, MOA, Memorandum of Agreement, um, between the parties pertains to additional FTEs. And the, the situation where this would be called for is if a Westford Academy teacher is, is on a leave of absence and um, coverage is needed for that class, another teacher, and this has happened uh, at times in the past, mm -hmm. that another teacher might, instead of teaching their typical teaching load of five classes, might teach a sixth class. And in recognition that they would be teaching an additional class instead of a 1.0 FTE, that teacher is now effectively a 1.2 FTE. So um, we set forth some conditions and parameters with the union about how that teacher would be compensated and how their, um, their other duties would be adjusted because they are taking on that extra class and extra workload. Um, any, any questions about that agreement? And yes. it, it could only ever be one additional class. That uh, correct? I believe in some no. rare cases it is right. in, two, in rare instances, and there, right. it might be a seventh class. And it, then do you add? Is it is, you know? There's the 20, 22 and a half percent. Is it 44, 45 percent at that point? Okay. Yes. Yeah. I felt like that was a little bit unclear in the language, um, like whether it was talking because at one point it says if they took an additional class, took on an additional class. But then it said they will be paid an additional 22.5% if mm -hmm. they took on additional classes. And so that was just, that was my confusion on, mm -hmm. on what was, what could happen and what would happen if they took on more than one. Uh, we, we did have, have legal uh, yeah. assist with the language. It was, it was certainly uh, clear with the union okay. and that, that was absolutely that their understanding and our intent. But thank you for the clarification. Any other questions? How was it handled today well, when, when a teacher is taking on additional classes? How how was it handled when? How was it handled today? Today, so before the COVID, how 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 do it? Oh, oh oh oh, pre COVID. Yeah. Okay. Pre COVID, when a teacher oh, actually is helping out teaching one additional block, uh, uh, what's the protocol? Th this is actually a practice that, mm. that we've you know engaged in for for years. Mm -hmm. um, we, it hadn't been um, memorialized in contractual language, and because it's happening more frequently this year. Mm -hmm. um, the, the union requested that we put it we put it in writing to clarify um, the process and the standards. But this has happened in the past. Um, there was a case, you know, in not 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 so far back where mm -hmm. uh, we did have a, a science teacher at the high school who departed right at the beginning of the school year. We weren't able to hire to replace that science teacher, and every science teacher in the department stepped up that year and taught an additional class. So mm -hmm. every teacher in the science department was a 1.2 that year. Um, so this has happened in the past and it, okay. it's been yeah, that's my question. in a similar So basically way. this puts the, the practice we are doing pre-COVID into a written language. Yeah. 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 For the most part. Make, yeah. Makes it official. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. and uh, but then, but then on the, the language actually uh, it's, has a sound like class. So because it's only for this year, right? So, if, uh, for example, if after COVID, um, when a teacher takes on one additional block, are we going to go back to the non-written language? What what we dis what we discussed with the union is really all the MOAs that we're en entering into right now are COVID-related MOAs. Mm -hmm. So they're really right. M M MOAs that pertain to this year. Um, this year is also the final year of the current union contract. So we will be re-entering into negotiations for a subsequent three-year contract. And when we enter those into those negotiations for a subsequent three-year contract, we agreed that this would be considered to be folded in to okay. the official contract going forward. Right. So the, there will be some negotiation at the table um, to, to put language that pertains to this issue 
in the next contract. Okay, got it. Because because this issue definitely is like the COVID makes issue happen more frequently, but mm -hmm. it, it always happens. Okay. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's correct. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I just had a quick question. Is yes, that yep. the when you mentioned like previous practice? Is that the same rate that has previously been used, or is that a change? It it is it is a slight change in in the rate. The rate ha the rate had previously been um, twenty percent. Any other questions? Then I I will make a motion to accept the um, uh, memorandum of understanding with the WEA regarding um, additional FTEs. Second. And all in favor? Thank you. <laughs> Unanimous. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the next um, MOA uh, pertains to stipends for um, coaches and for extracurricular activities. Um, the MOA sets forth a process for how um, extracurriculars and um, Principal Antonelli touched on this would be approved. Um, there would be a process for all extracurriculars this year. We normally do this for new clubs, but this year we'll be doing it for all clubs, that all club advisors will put forth a proposal that will um, set forth how the club will operate in this environment. Um, would the club be operating remotely? Would uh, the club have in-person activities? How would that be done safely? If, but for some reason, the school system did switch to a remote context, would the, a the activity be able to continue in a full remote context? Um, if, and this for sets forth some processes and procedures for how to clearly delineate how stipends would be paid um, for these activities. Uh, depending on whether they continue for the full year or whether they might, there might be some disruption um, due to public health circumstances. It was very complex last mm -hmm. spring when this happened and it happened very suddenly and it just made sense to kind of set forth these parameters up front. Of course, we hope it doesn't happen. We hope that we're in operation for the full year, but um, we just thought we'd iron those details out ahead of time. So any questions on the next MOA? So I say you only have two tiers, like 50% to 100%. Mm -hmm. right. So theoretically, if a teacher actually does 5% of work and then suddenly shut down, the, 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 he or she can still like receive at least 50% of the pay. I think in the, in the discussions, um, Ming Chen, there was definitely a recognition that uh, teachers and cl club advisors and, and also um, sports coaches really do a lot at the beginning of, of an activity mm -hmm. to really prepare for the activity and to set forth everything. So even if they were only partially into, say, the duration of, of an activity, um, that really a lot of preparation and work had gone into that. Um, and really also the advisor had really made a time commitment from their personal standpoint um, mm -hmm. to carve out that time. Um, so it, it seemed like a fair recognition of all of that effort. Mm -hmm. um, if the activity continued past, say, the halfway point of the year, or if it's a shorter duration activity, the halfway point of the duration of the activity, well, then that's really substantial co completion of it. So that kind of was the gateway to then the payment of the full stipend. So that was the, the scheme we, we arrived at. And yeah. a full stipend was only guaranteed in a club or activity that could be held fully remote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there, there were a lot of remote, hybrid, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just trying to simplify the process. And okay, so, so, so basically that uh, if, if it's not, uh, it cannot happen remotely, then, then it cannot be paid. Uh, then it would fall to the 50% okay. or 100%. Right. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, depending I get, on the I get amount it, yeah. of completion, mm -hmm. right? right? Yeah, because exactly. a lot of the activity they have to actually put a lot of front load work yeah. before mm -hmm. it even happens. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, okay. exactly. Exactly. Any mm -hmm. other, any other questions? Okay. Motion to approve the memorandum of under understanding between 
um, the school committee and Westford Education Association regarding stipends and extracurriculars. Second. And all in favor? Thank you, everybody. And now, so we don't get in trouble with Ingrid, uh -huh. warrants. Okay. Motion to approve payroll warrant number 2112 SP dated September 17, 2020, in the amount of $1,930,207.07. Second. And all in favor? All I in forgot. favor or texting? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. I was actually looking down. <laughs> You're good. All right. Okay. Unanimous. Motion to approve. It's late. <laughs> no, we're getting because we lost all power. Yeah. First, we don't have power. We're, get, we're getting punchy. Uh -huh. Okay, go ahead. Motion to approve expense warrant 2112 SE dated September 17th, 2020 in the amount of $322,000, 322 $9,092.11. Come out, come. Second. <laughs> did, did we get that? <laughs> are, are we good? <laughs> See, they, they have the numbers. You've got the number. You, get, you got the yeah. numbers. I, I have them too. It covers what we need to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you hit every number. You hit every number. So it may not be in the right order. But the numbers are all there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For the record, three hundred twenty-two thousand ninety-two dollars and eleven cents. That's the time. Yeah. Yeah. I seconded. Uh, do we get a second? Yeah. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Wow, we are getting punchy. We should not do numbers after ten o'clock. Um, and oh, we also have minutes. Yes. Motion to approve school committee regular session minutes dated August 31st, 2020. Second. Any comments or questions? All in favor? There we go. I saw all the hands, unanimous. And uh, final item of business. Are we, are we doing, okay, I just want to make sure, confirm. Yeah. I, I think it will be brief. Okay. Motion to adjourn to executive session to discuss strategy with respect to WEA collective bargaining and an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position. The school committee will not return to public session. Second. second. You can duke it out over who got the second there. Yeah, he got it. And we do need to roll call this. So, Valerie. Aye. Ming Chen. Aye. Aye. Avery. Aye. 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 And that is unanimous. We are adjourned. Uh, thank you to the public. Um, I guess we'll figure that out procedurally. Thank you to the public for joining us tonight. And we will see you in not two weeks, but two weeks in one day. Correct. We'll and I just on. wanted to. We will see you on the Tuesday due Tuesday to the, 29th. the Jewish holidays. Thank you. thank you very much. See you on the 29th.